Yes, and I'm presenting the cases for review in today's public hearing. Uh, the board does ask if you would please silence your cell phones before we begin. Put that on vibrate or silent so as not to disrupt today's proceedings. The, uh, the board is empowered to act on cases before you today as outlined in section 1740-180 of the Metro Code of Law. Uh, the zoning code is a part of this record and was adopted by the Metro Council on January 1st, 1998 and is uh, here at the podium and I, and I enter it as into the record for today's cases. The board requires uh, for cases heard today, uh, cases without opposition, applicants will have five minutes to present their testimony where you're seated up at the table in front of you here. Uh, there's a little button on the table, just hit that on the right hand side. Your microphone will be read like this, and then you're, you're ready to speak. To your right will be a clock up on the, on the uh, pedestal there that, that will keep track of your time. That clock will run during testimony, start and stop for questions and answers from the board, uh, then resume once you begin testimony today. If you're here for a case that has opposition, each side of that case has 10 minutes to present their testimony to the board. That's 10 minutes in total, not by person. So if there are multiple speakers, please divide your time accordingly before you come up to the board. All cases heard on today's agenda uh, for approval must have four affirmative votes of this board to be granted. Um, I believe we have all seven members present, Mr. Chairman, or will have. Sure. Oh, we are all here, okay. Sorry, didn't see you there, Mr. Law. Uh, in the event there is a tie vote, a uh, failure to get four votes, your case will remain on the agenda for 30 days, uh, at which the board will consider it its next, next, uh, next hearing. If after 30 days you don't have four affirmative votes, your case is deemed denied by operation of law. Um, the board does utilize a consent agenda, and I'm about to call the case which is recommended for consent, but before I do, the, count, the uh, board does allow council members uh, to speak before we begin public hearing. Are there any council members present? I apologize, I, I don't recognize you with mask on. Uh, council lady, would you like to speak at this time or would you like to wait for your case? I'll, I'll wait for the case. Okay. Are there any other council members present? Mr. Chairman, seeing none, I'll go ahead and present the consent agenda for consideration. Uh, the, the case recommended for consent agenda is case 2000-21, excuse me, 2021-61. All professional construction is the appellant, Deborah Gasho, the owner of the property at 99 South Gray Cross Avenue, requesting a variance from street setbacks in RS-20. Uh, the appellant seeking to construct a covered front porch. Uh, is there any parties present opposed to case 61? You're not opposed, you're the applicant. Uh, no worries. Any opposition to the case? Uh, that would not be good for your client, for the builder to be opposed to it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I see none. The board is recommending this case for approval with the condition that this uh, front porch remain uncovered and unenclosed, and the uh, appellant has agreed to that condition. So that's the only okay. item I've got on today's and, consent. And we have a letter from the council person of that district saying that there's no community opposition as well, just for the record. And so there's a motion for the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion, there's a second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye, raise your hand. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, if you're here for case 61, you're free to go, Mr. Preston. Um, uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I believe we've got one uh, preliminary matter before we begin. Uh, Jessica, do you have the, um, I think the board members have a request for a, a rehearing. Uh, which is- We do. Okay, which is uh, in front of you, and, and typically you all have considered those cases at the beginning of the agenda. Okay, uh, yeah, there is a, an applicant did ask us, uh, did move that we rehear uh, his case. It's case 2021-021-1911B, uh, 10th uh, Avenue North, and that was to put uh, a, min a, a variance from the minimum lot size to put two homes on a, a lot that's uh, not large enough by about 9%. We heard this case, I believe, uh, well, on March 18th, and it was originally scheduled for uh, the 4th of 
February, there's a packet. And Joey, do we actually, I, I think that the, the criteria is that we ask the applicant if there was information that was discovered that would not have been available uh, at the time of the original hearing. Not uh, so, and, and I think that that's generally what our criteria is, right? It is, Mr. Chairman, but it's in the form of letters as submitted. Uh, okay. But it is not to take new testimony from the applicant. Okay, so we have our packet uh, in our, the information in our packet. I think this was one that, that um, was denied four votes to three votes and um, was one that, um, I, I think I may have been the, the fourth, well, we all, you know, who, who was the fourth vote, but, but I had to cast the last vote. Now, you know, I was torn on it. Uh, I didn't see anything in the packet that was what could not have been um, presented earlier. I, I was impressed that they did go to the effort of getting quite a lot of community support letters, which were not part of the original packet, but that's certainly something that could have been done uh, prior. And the, and the uh, applicant had, I think the case was deferred at least six weeks, I think two meetings which gave a little more time for that preparation too. So I'm not inclined to rehear the case, but I am willing to consider if the board is to start the applicant's uh, six month clock, which allows him to reapply at the date of his original hearing, which he did show up for, and we asked him to defer it and to get more information. So that was February 4th. He, we actually heard the case on March 18th, but I would be willing to to uh, not rehear the case, but allow the applicant to reapply if he chooses, like any applicant can that's denied, uh, to have the six month clock, clock start on February 4th. Mr. Chairman, is that in essence a motion that I could second? If there's no other discussion prior to the motion, then I would make that motion. Then I would second it. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on that motion? I had a thought if the six months could start from the day he filed, is that legally even possible? early? Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know what day that is, but I'm, and, and there's probably not, it, I, I'm, I'm willing to give him some time, but I think that might actually make it closer to like a true rehearing. And, and to me, I think that the day, the day you first show up is when, you know, that's the first date we could have made a decision. And that's where I just chose that logic. But if others, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm just judging on not on head nods and you know our shakes. So, <laughs> but it was just an idea. Okay. But your motion's fine. It, is, well, that's fine, and that's part of the discussion, right? So, any other discussion or thoughts? There's a motion on the floor to deny the request for rehearing and to allow the applicant, if the applicant chooses, to reapply for this variance six months after the date of the first hearing, which was February fourth. That motion is out there and seconded, and with no other discussion, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye, raise your hand, aye. Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Okay, Mr. Chairman, we'll, uh, we'll notify the applicant of the board's action today, uh, and we'll dispense with that case. I do have a couple preliminary announcements. I apologize, members. I've, uh, I've winged the opening announcements from six years ago from my head. So um, I did leave out a couple of things. So some preliminary announcements, uh, Mr. Chairman. We have uh, a couple of cases that have been withdrawn from today's agenda. Uh, the first case of which, and, and these cases that I speak to now will not be heard today because they have been withdrawn. Uh, the first case is 2021-52. It's GBT Realty Corp. Uh, appellant Brentwood United Methodist Church. Uh, for the property at 7236 Old Burkett Road. Uh, they were requesting a variance in the minimum foundation requirements. That case has been withdrawn by the applicant and will not be heard. So if you're here for case 52, you are free to go. The second case withdrawn uh, is case 2021-65 A plus storage, Old Hickory Boulevard LP, the appellant and owner of the property at 505 Old Hickory Boulevard in Bellevue requesting uh, a variance from the sidewalk requirements in an SP district. Uh, the applicant has, uh, has been granted a waiver from construction, but is required to pay the in lieu of fee uh, in this instance, uh, and zoning administrator can certainly comment on it. But uh, there were uh, circumstances on the property dealing with gas lines that necessitated his, uh, 
his waiver request. So that has been withdrawn by this by staff and will be handled uh, that way. So that's case 65. If you're here for it, you are also um, free to go. And that is all of the preliminary announcements. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, we'll call the first case. And when your case is called, if you'll come forward to the table here, please have a seat. The process will be that I will introduce the case and show photographs to the board. And then after my presentation, you'll, you'll begin with your side. If there is opposition to a case, um, you, we'll hear from the opposition next, and then the applicant will get a period for rebuttal. So it is important for applicants to uh, save some of their uh, allotted time uh, for rebuttal should they wish to partake in it. The uh, first case before the board today is ooh, not Windows Media Player. Uh, Yes, sir. Um, there you go. Should be coming up now. Uh, the first case today heard by the board will be case 2021-59. Mr. Benjamin Stauffer is the appellant and owner of the property at 118 Lucille Street, requesting a rear setback variance uh, from 20 feet to 5 feet in the R6A district to allow the existing detached structure to be used as a second dwelling on the lot. Uh, Mr. Stauffer, present. All right, come forward, please, sir. Have a seat there. I'll go through the photographs first and show the board, and then I'll turn it over to you. Are there any parties present opposed to case 59? Case 59, Mr. Chairman, seeing none, we'll have five minutes on this case. The, um, the subject property you see is located uh, in the R6A district on the south margin of Lucille Street, just east of Dickerson Pike. This is an aerial photograph of the property. The, the building in question is located at the rear of the property here where my cursor is. This is the uh, site plan submitted to the board by the applicant. As a detached accessory structure, the location of this building is fine. Uh, upon its conversion to a second residence or dwelling unit on the lot, the zoning code requires a 20-foot rear setback. So as such, the variance is spelled out in for you. Um, this is looking at the subject property. Property is to either side. And then a view from the, in the upper left, the photograph from the uh, street view back to this structure and then the structure in question, bottom left photograph. And then the photograph on the right uh, attempting to show the distance between here and the rear property line, which is uh, right along in that area there. So I'll leave the site plan up for you. Uh, Mr. Stoffer, if you would please identify yourself and make your presentation to the board. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, and members of the board, I appreciate your time. Um, I'll be brief. I'm just going to kind of uh, restate what I had discussed in the hardship application. Um, my property, uh, my name is Ben Stauffer. I've lived at the residence in East Nashville at 118 Lucille Street since uh, I bought it in May of 2019. And the uh, existing uh, structure in question was there for some time undetermined uh, prior to my purchase of the property. My property at 118 Lucille Street has a secondary yurt style structure, which was built by a previous owner with no building permits currently on file with the Nashville, Met Nashville Metro Planning Department. When I purchased the property in May of 2019, it was zoned RS5. I rezoned the property to R6A to allow for two family dwellings, uh, for two family dwellings all other zoning and building conditions being met. Uh, as such, the related hardship was created prior to my purchase of the property and its subsequent rezoning. My intention, intention for use of the secondary unit is as a short-term rental and short-term residence for family and other visitors uh, when it's available. This unit is a two-story slab structure, which is significantly shorter than any other two-story structures in the near area and I occupy the, occupy the main house in the front of the property. So it will be a, um, uh, not an investor owned, it will be a, a, um, occup owner occupied rental. The lot is narrow with the frontage dimension being approximately 50 feet and having an adjacent lot on each side. Um, uh, in addition to, uh, to other um, statistics about the property, you can see that um, there is only about an, a little over a nine foot setback uh, from the second property to, to the alley. Um, the public alley is currently not in use, but um, uh, there is ample uh, walkway um, and 
so forth between the, the alley um, and that structure. Utilization of this pre-existing structure as detached duplex would not only not injure neighboring properties, but would add value to the neighborhood. During my rezoning process in 2019 to 20, the Highland Heights Neighborhood Association and my councilman, Sean Parker, expressed support for my rezoning and intended use as appropriate under the Highland Heights Community Planning Study adopted June 8, 2018. My adjacent neighbors have all expressed orally their approval of my plans for use of the building. While I do intend to gain financially from the use of the building as a rental, the alternative would be for the previously existing structure to essentially function as a storage unit for not only me, but for future zone of the owners of the property if it's not able to be used as a dwelling. Um, my short-term rental plan is to provide a competitively priced one-bed, one-bath location in an underdeveloped neighborhood uh, for visitors to Nashville, a city which recently had the highest average hotel room rate in the U.S. So I yield my time uh, for any questions or comment. So but when you had your property rezoned, was it just your property or was it your street or was it, was it more than just your, tell me what was rezoned. Sure, it was just my property um, for the intended use of having to two dwellings on it. Okay. And then the, you said that you, you always foresee this being either rental uh, of some sort or, you know, uh, I guess if we were to put um, a condition that it, it, would this be considered a, a day do? The short answer is it doesn't necessarily have to be. It's R6A zoning, which means it is potentially duplex eligible or two family eligible based upon the three criteria outlined in 17.16.030. Okay. Um, in all likelihood, it, it's more likely to function as a as a DADU just because of the reduced setback. Right. It's more likely to fit in than a regular two family development, which would carry a 20 foot rear setback, which is what brings them in today. So it depends is the more concise answer. But it, and, and it, but it was it was completely rezoned. So, so I mean, it's it's it, it there shouldn't be. I, I guess I shouldn't have an issue with it. Just following whatever its base zoning is because it went through the process to be rezoned. Yeah, and I should clarify that it was as a detached duplex that I filed this variance application today. And um, one property at 114, two houses down has has a recent R6A zoning for future development there and okay. others in the area. And is your house in a historic district? Are you in an overlay? Do you know? I'm not familiar just, with that. Just, but, all right. So just curious. No. Yeah. And so you're asking for that the variant that the rear setback being, I guess, what nine feet four inches? Is Correct. That what it was? Okay. Correct. Are there other questions for that? Yeah. Sure. Um, did the five neighbors that are shown on the screen here, um, what did they have to say about um, this variance? Yeah. Um, I can tell you the two next to me um, were perfectly fine with it, as was the one behind me at 117. Um, I haven't talked directly with 115 or 19 Eastmoreland, um, or I guess that would be 122. Uh, Lucille, however, the appropriate letters were sent out, and I don't believe anyone's objected as of today. Other questions for the applicant? Did you have anything else to add? I do not, thank you. All right, with no questions, nothing to add, we will close the public hearing. Discussion, thoughts? Well, I mean, it was there when the applicant bought the property and it's, it's an existing structure that looks like it ought to be used as a dwelling. And um, I mean, he's done everything right that his predecessor apparently didn't do right. So, um, and and I'm, uh, and the fact that the the uh, owner of 117 East Moreland does not object, which is right behind it, is pretty big to me. So I'm I'm in favor of it. I agree with what you said. Anybody? Is that something you mind putting in a motion, Mr. Peck? Yeah. <laughs> I'll be glad to. I would. I move that we approve the. Application. A second. Have a motion. Have a second. Any other discussion? 
Yeah, can we just clarify that the requested setback is um, 9.4 feet? I think that's what I'm reading on there. So, is that the, the variance is for a setback of nine? That's where the four inches setback, are. Correct. Yeah, I guess I was asking that because in the um, docket it says five foot. Right. So it would be it would be at the at the nine foot four inches or that is the edge of yeah. the existing it's building. Either nine foot four inches or nine point four, but it's I guess we should just say what's shown in the in the packet. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't, can't tell from the plat. I, mean, yeah, I know I it's a required 20-foot setback, as I understand it, and I'm not sure exactly what the as-built is, but... Yeah, if I, if I may, it is 9.4 feet, not 9 feet 4 inches. That's just kind of how, the, okay. how it was designed. So 9 foot uh, 4. Yeah, not, so yeah. I'll amend the motion to provide that the setback is 9 foot 4 is inches. 9.4 9. feet. Nine point four feet. Nine point four feet. Yeah. Nine point four feet. Okay. So be right. a little under five inches. All right. Got a motion. Got a second. Is there any more discussion? All in favor of that motion, say aye. Raise your hand. Any opposed to that motion? Opposed or not? But you opposed. So that motion passes uh, five six to one. I'm glad we're all here, but I'm having to learn to count. <laughs> all right. Uh, next case. Okay, Mr. Chairman, our next case, uh, actually skipped that one, that was on consent. The uh, next case before the board will be 2021-63, Mr. Stephen Rideout, appellant and owner of the property at 1452 Pawnee Trail, requesting a variance from the street setback requirements in RS-15. The appellant is seeking to construct a garage and maintain the existing porch, referred to the board under section 1720-030. C3, the appellant has alleged the board would have jurisdiction under section 1740, 180, item B. Uh, is the applicant present in case 63? Here. All right, yeah. sir. Good. I, sorry, I didn't see you there. Uh, let me present the uh, photographs to the board, and then I'll turn it over to you. Are there any parties present in opposition to case 63? Mr. Chairman, I see none. Uh, applicant will have five minutes. The uh, subject property you see here is in red located on the west margin of Pawnee Trail uh, in the Neely's Bend area. This is an aerial photograph of the property. A little hard to pick up. The uh, gray roof uh, residence sits here. And the uh, nature of the request is a, is a street setback variance. The setback as required by the contextual street setback is 31.55 feet. That is based, as you see in the table here, on the four closest residences to this gentleman's home. And then his proposed garage construction would be located uh, in the dark gray, which you see there, and proposing a setback of 23.61 feet. So the variance there listed. Uh, this is the look at the front of the subject property. Uh, and then views to property of either side. I'll come back to this photograph. This is the uh, location of the construction of the garage located in this area. And the, uh, that deals with the variance that's before you today. And with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant to present his testimony. Sir, if you would, if you would turn on your microphone just by pressing the, pressing the button at the bottom and it, the red light will turn on. There you go. Okay. And state your name and address, and then tell us what you're trying to do. Steve Rideout at 1452 Pawnee Trail up in Madison. Uh, that pretty much just summed it up right there. I was just looking to build a uh, garage just for personal use. I mean, you can see where I got a boat and a truck sitting. Uh, I've got a, a little bit of adjustment to make on the CVSL line is what this is all about at this point that I understand, excuse me. And uh, so we started out looking for a variance of about 10 feet. And I ended up taking a couple of feet off of it just so I could even pull it back just a little bit. I can't really move the garage back for the elevation of the, of the property. Uh, the road is a little deceiving if you were there when you were looking at the uh, other photographs. It is a dead end, and there's only one person as we're standing there facing my house, the house with the red roof. 
And if you'll go back to the bottom picture, this guy has a privacy fence. The guy across the street from me has a nice big wide open area. It's almost like we're on a peninsula down there. Nobody really cares if I put a garage there, but you know, to stay within the guidelines and stay within the, uh, you know, the compliance, uh, that's why I'm here today to see if I might be able to do so. The garage is just for my simple, my personal use. Just, that's my garage. How, how, how tall is the garage? Is it taller than your house? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, what I was wanting to do was put like a, um, I guess you would call it a second floor up there for the, you know, for storage and workshop area and that sort of thing. And uh, just so that, because I'm looking down the road thinking, you know, to make it, you know, I wanna go, don't want to look back on it and go shoulda, woulda, coulda. I should have right. done more with it than just flatlined it. Now, and help me understand, you, you're asking, I think, for almost an eight foot variance, right? I think it's 7.94, is, is that right? That's correct. <laughs> eight, basically an eight foot variance versus the 10. We started the, with a 10 and I thought, well, maybe if I shade the front of it off a little bit, then maybe that would get me a little bit more clearance on the CBSL line. Right, and then when I look at this, when I look at your site plan, not knowing anything about the elevation of, or the topography of your lot, my first question is, why don't you just scoot it all back? Now, when I look at the pictures, I, I see an existing slab that is probably something you're wanting to, to keep. Mm -hmm. But what is behind that slab, and why couldn't you just push the whole thing back? Well, that's, like I said, the elevation of the property kind of drops off so much back there that, and we're talking cutting down trees and bringing in lots of buildup, you know, just to... So yeah, you, you would be keeping mature trees and the slope of the lot is... Right, I wouldn't change the elevation of the property. And if I did, then I would probably potentially have a water back up in the back on that, that side of the property because of the way that it rolls okay. off. And have you talked to your... Have you spoken with your neighbors about... Oh, yeah, they're just like, they're just like, when, when, we, when are you going to do this? Okay. <laughs> yeah, they're all for it. Okay. Yeah. Are, are there other questions? Why does the garage need to be 38 feet deep? <laughs> let, let me just say this. It's one of those things where the bigger the better. Suppose, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's, I've got, like I said, where you see that boat parked. Any, you know, it's, that's going to take up a whole lot of my space right there. And then on the back side of it, I hope to, I plan to have a uh, workshop area with a workbench on the back looking out into the backyard and so I started at a 20 or a, a 20 by 40 and then when I started running into you know the issues with the CBSL I thought well if I if I knock a couple of feet off the front and pull it back a little bit maybe that would help my case but it's just one of those things where you know most guys in here are going to say the same thing, you know, at that garage. You know, it's a guy thing. What's well, what that garage? It's hard to see from the photo, but is are you proposing that the front of the garage be in line with the existing building pad? Actually, if you look at the front door, that is a porch that sticks out about, it's 10 feet out, or is it six feet? I've looked at it so many times. And what's going to happen is, is if you look at that, those windows there on the left in the picture, as you come out, it's going to come back, but it won't be flush with the front, but it will give it character as opposed to running it just straight across. Does the existing garage pad jut out from the house? Is that what I'm seeing? Uh, yeah, just a few feet. You right, know, it's not very much. But you're proposing to come out a little further. Excuse me? The, are you proposing to come out a little bit further than the existing pad now? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. It will actually be back, uh, back in line with the rest of the house, but maybe just a couple of feet out, but not as far as what the actual front porch. Yeah, I was thinking about the corner where the downspout is. Right, mm -hmm. right. Okay. Yeah, see, it will come out where that downspout is. It, it will come out just maybe a couple, two or three feet right there, maybe four, I can't remember exactly. 
but it won't come out as far as what the front porch actually does. Okay, thank you. Okay. And speaking of which, also, there is a question about that front porch being in, um, you know, not in compliance, and it's mentioned in today's. I think like a foot point oh nine inches, and speaking with the, you know, with the uh, zoning appeals folks, the kind folks was need to see about addressing that issue as well. That was there when I when I bought the house in December of 2019. Uh, I'm sure that it was probably mentioned somewhere, and I'm sure that I probably signed off on it, you know, in small print, you know. I, it's, I just kind of bought that as is, inherited that, so to speak. Do you, do you plan on doing anything with, like, you, it says retain that porch, so you're not planning to build, like, a cover or, like, a roof on that or anything. You're just like, trying to maintain it as it is, is that what, for that front porch? Oh yeah, the front porch okay. will just stay as it is. Okay. It's there's it's it's like a built-on front porch, but it you know inside it's open like a built-in front porch, and then there's a deck on the front of it. The porch is not in question; it's the deck. You know, the deck itself. At one point, the property kind of slopes toward the angle as it goes down. It's in a curve, and that's what's messed me up. The folks to the left over here with the red roof, their house would be closer, and I'd be fine. But that curve in that dead end street where nobody lives mm -hmm. has thrown me into a spin here because of the CBSL line. Yeah, we have, we have that in the survey. We can kind of see pretty well. Okay. That's doing. Thank you. Well, to me, it's all kind of confusing. It's all brand new to me. <laughs> any any other questions for the applicant? Did you have anything else to add? No, no. I mean, y'all pretty much summed it up in that opening statement, Mr. There. Wallace. Uh, Again, and, and maybe some of the other folks in here today will listen to this. I'm, I'm one of those tree type people. I like big trees and I like mature trees if they're not hackberries. Um, so what, what can you tell me that gives me a much warmer feel that you've got two pretty good sized trees next to your truck in the picture I'm looking at? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's your intent to save them now, but have you checked with an arborist or anybody like that to make sure whatever you're going to construct there ultimately does not affect the integrity of the root systems or anything like that? Actually, I didn't speak or seek a professional on that issue, but so far so good. That foundation there, so to speak, is just kind of like topsoil that's been removed. And it really didn't get into root roots and that sort of thing. Gosh, those trees been there forever, and I hope that they remain. I don't plan on those going away. No. So just looking at this picture, are you saying that you can't just shift the garage back eight feet without affecting those pond trees? Correct. That and the elevation of the yard. If you'll notice my neighbor over here, how his house sits much lower. So all the water runs from here across. If I move that back, what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to end up probably just basically building a little bit of a border. Now I'm going to have water backing up in my backyard because it's back there, it starts to slope pretty good. The further you go back, the further it starts to slope, drop down, drop down. And I've reassured my neighbor over here that I am not designing this for the water to run off onto his property. And he's like, I'm not really seeing a problem with it. And if I set it back like that, I mean, just simple layman terms, it would just look, it just wouldn't even look right. It would just look but the way I've got it designed, the character of it is going to look really nice. If I push that thing, even if I could push it back, it would, it would give you, it would just, it wouldn't even look right. It would just look like, what are you, what are you doing with that? Why'd you do that? <laughs> All right. Any other, any other questions? All right. Nothing else to add. Uh, that's it. All right. The public hearing is now closed. Discussion. Uh, um. Mr. Chairman, just from looking at our packet and looking at the survey, I can see an argument for a hardship based off of the elevation and the slope. Um, I don't know if this is like 
the least intrusive means to do this. So I was going to rely on our architects. I'm interested in their opinion, but just at first glance, it looks like there's a case for a hardship and that he would be entitled to some variance in order to do this. I just don't know how much. So that was my thought. I think it's reasonable to ask for the variance so that he can be in line with the existing building pad for the garage. And I think that's what he's asking because I'm kind of verifying it with the photo. Um, you know, the size of the garage, I think, is large, but he has the right to go as back as far as he wants, actually. This is really just a front setback variance. Yeah. So I think it will help him to save the trees and stay out of the, the slope um, back there if, he, if we do grant the variance. Um, so I'm inclined to vote in favor of it and keeping the existing uh, front porch. Well, on the site plan, I'm not seeing any, you know, real topography or any vegetation, so I really can't speak to, I mean, we're going off an of image, but I, I really can't speak to if we, you know, if you shift the garage back, if it really will damage those existing mature trees. Um, and it seems like a really large garage. You know, so, it will yes, sir, the, <laughs> the public hearing is closed, so this is just, just for us to talk. Yeah, you know, I just don't see why you wouldn't uh, build it in line with the front face of the home and be within that setback. Yeah, I agree with you that we're relying on his testimony about yeah. the, the yeah. sloped um, back of the site. Um, but, and I, I would agree with you too. I, I, I wanted it to be in line with the, the um, adjacent home where I wanted to line up, but because the building pad juts out a bit, that's the only reason why I would be in favor of it just being built on top of that existing pad. Okay. There's a pretty sharp, I mean, visually it, it looks to be a pretty sharp slope in the photo. Now, I don't, you know, photos are, can be deceptive, but it does look like it, it drops like it, he was saying, but I, I don't really have an issue. Although I think maybe all of us or we've all expressed it, at least on paper and it, it would be nice if it were not quite this request, <laughs> but I think that the applicant's done a good job of explaining uh, the need for this request and the fact that it's on a dead end street and the other two neighbors appear to have similar uh, amenities it, 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 as this and it, 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 and there is a slope and there are mature trees. I, I don't really have a problem with it unless. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't want to, is it possible to like briefly <laughs> reopen the hearing just to see if the applicant has any pictures of the back part of the house just to sort of address Mr. Cole's concern? I don't know if he does, but just to ask him if he does so that he can right, demonstrate. Sir, sir did you, are there pictures of the back of the house? Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other, any other thoughts or a motion? Well, do we typically look at existing building pad as a hardship? You know, I don't necessarily think that's a hardship. You still can build the front of the face, front face of the building further back. I don't think it's a hardship per se. I just didn't think it was unreasonable to not want to have to. Um, I think you'd have to saw cut and take away the, some of the building pad, and it seems to be like it would be less obtrusive to just build right on that building pad. That that's just my. Well, and about it. We, we, an irregular of this shape a lot is one of the, the listed setback require or, or variance require, uh, hardships. And, and that, you know, there is a curve to the street. It does kind of hurt him on that side where he's looking to build a garage, which is the natural side to do it on. So I could see, I could see a hardship in the irregularly shaped lot. Any other, any other thoughts or a motion? I sure wish I knew how far back those trees were in the back. That, that's causing me just a bit of concern. And my fellow tree person to your right up there hasn't said a single word yet. And I seem to be the only one talking about trees now. Bill, I'm, I'm befuddled because when the, when the architects can't agree, it, it, <laughs> yeah. into, I, it spins me into it. Well, we were sort of making comments over <laughs> here on, your, on the left on that same thing, so. Well, and I, I do think he's building on on the footprint of the existing pad. And so, you know, I don't know if, if they're digging and, you know, I don't know what you have to do to build that, but. 
I, mean, I guess let's, maybe yeah. we, maybe as, we, as far as the existing pad goes, I'm, I'm, if he's wanting to build a two-story structure on here, I'm, I'm doubting that, that that has the structural capacity to hold a two-story structure. Just guessing, but. All right, back back to the the question a, a, a minute ago. Are other comments or a motion from anybody? I would feel better if um, my other colleagues were able to see the back <laughs> with photos and um, a little bit of more understanding of the topography instead of um, just relying on the testimony. And so I will move to defer the case one meeting so that we can, um, the applicant can bring us photos and other information about um, the back of the property. I second. I have a motion to defer the meet, the case one meeting, which is two weeks, is that right? What is today? Yeah, two weeks from today, uh, so that the applicant can provide photographs of the back of the home to show the distance between the trees and the pad as well as the slope of the back of the home, uh, the, the back of the lot. Any other discussion? I would, I, I would also ask for the, the size of that existing pad, or like the, the dimensions of that existing concrete s slab that's there. Okay, and yep. as well as the, the size of the existing slab. I have a friendly suggestion to the applicant is on Metro GIS, you can pull off the topography so you don't have to get the surveyor to give you that information. Um, someone, I'm sure, from Metro Codes can show you how to pull the, the um, topography off that website so that we can see the, how it slopes in the back. Okay. All right, have a motion, have a second. Any other discussion? Well, one other. I think uh, particularly for Mr. Lawless and I, it would be good to know where, how much distance there will be between the trees and, and where the, the back of the building will be as it is, and, and I think that allows to see how far you can push it back, so. Okay, I have a motion, I have a second. Any more discussion or comments? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Any opposed? That motion passes. We will see you in two weeks. Thank you. Next case. Okay, Mr. Chairman, the next case before us is case 2021-64. Ms. Stephanie Foster is the appellant and owner of the property at 415 Bramblewood Drive. Uh, they're requesting an item A appeal challenging the zoning administrator's revocation of a home occupation permit, 2020-58785 in the RS-20 district. The appellant has, is seeking to continue to operate the pet grooming business at the residence, referred to the board under section um, should be 17-16-250. The appellant has alleged jurisdiction under section 1740-180, item A. Uh, are there any parties uh, present opposed to case 64? Okay. As I talked about at the beginning, all those folks with your hand raised, you have 10 minutes in total to speak to this board. So before you come up here, please work out your time and who's speaking and how long. But. Uh, your opportunity to speak will be in third position behind uh, um, Mr. King Barkley and his client, and then myself uh, sitting as the zoning administrator's designee. So. And, and Joey, we just just to give a you, you tell me if I'm if I misstate this, but this is an item A appeal, and what that means is that the appellant who's present believes that the zoning administrator uh, made an error in. Uh, his judgment. And so our question that this board is asking today is, did the zoning administrator err? It's the only question uh, that we're asking uh, this board to determine. And the order that we go in is the uh, zoning uh, team will explain the case and why uh, this permit was revoked. The applicant will have a chance to uh, explain why that was revoked in error. The folks who uh, believe that the zoning administrator was correct and that are opposed to this uh, business being there will have a chance to say why they think that this was the correct decision. And then the uh, applicant will have uh, whatever is left from their original 10 minutes for rebuttal of that. So 
just wanted to make sure everybody understood kind of the order of the case since there's a lot of folks here. Each side gets a total of 10 minutes, as Joey said, and if there's a lot of folks, uh, just make sure you uh, work it out uh, who's going to speak and, and how long so that folks don't get left out. So that I'm clear, the zoning administrator's time does not apply towards e either. The yeah, the zoning administrator's okay. time and or questions from this board. So if the board asks a question, it doesn't count against your time. Uh, it's just you're, you're free speaking, making your case. That counts against your time. But if we ask for clarification or an additional question, that does not count against your time. Sure. It, Chairman, uh, I believe we have a council member here too, so her time, does that count? That's right, and, and the council, as always, according to our board rules, council uh, members are, uh, are allowed to speak whenever they would choose to speak, either uh, before, after, or during the case, if they'll raise their hand, and, and there is no time limit for the council members uh, talk. So anyway, that was maybe more than you wanted to hear, but since there's a lot of folks, I just wanted to make sure everybody understood what the process is. Uh, and so hopefully we can be a little more efficient in our, in our hearing. So, all right, Joey, tell us, tell us why we're here. Yes, uh, this case comes before you uh, based upon the revocation that I made uh, in, in this particular instance, the zoning administrator deferred uh, action upon this to me. Uh, so I'm sitting in, in, in his position today, but uh, this case comes uh, following complaints on a home occupation permit, which was 2020058785, in which was issued to Miss Stephanie Foster to operate a dog grooming business from her premises at 415 Bramblewood Drive. Um, the, procedurally, the uh, complaints were received by the codes department. The property standards division of codes uh, sent an abate notice to Miss Foster on two points. Uh, one was that she violated the, the, the terms of the home occupation permit, and the second was that she was operating two businesses from the residence. Uh, I did investigate that the second of the two and determined based upon filings with the Secretary of State that there were not two, uh, corp uh, two companies operating from this facility. So I've dismissed the abate for that second portion. The first portion that's before you, however, uh, is the, the complaints by, received by uh, parties that, that Ms. Foster is in violation of the terms of the home occupation permit. Um, members, the home occupation permit section um, that's discussed is in 1716-250-D. I'll, I'll enter the zoning code as, as part of the record. Um, and I'll give you a little uh, time frame of what occurred. Uh, based upon those uh, complaints, I sent Ms. Foster a notice that her permit was revoked. Uh, in my in in my sending out the letter, I did not date that letter. I believe it to be around the uh, middle of February in which I sent that letter to Ms. Foster. Uh, Ms. Foster's attorney, and who's present with you now, Mr. King Bartley, uh, wrote a letter back to me uh, asking for, you know, to sort of answer the charges. I did meet with Mr. Bartley at his office to and pass to him a copies of the complaint photographs that we had received, some of which are in your packet that were attached to my first revocation letter. So I reinstated the permit on March 1st uh, and provide uh, counsel to provide some additional information, which he did on March 4th. And uh, on March 17th, I again revoked the permit on seven grounds, um, of which were too many employees at the premises and too many customers visits on specific days that we listed. Uh, the next day, uh, Ms. Foster's legal counsel supplied some additional information uh, in which I reinstated the permit uh, for 14 days at that time to review the information that he gave me. Uh, I did drop the charges in which there were too many customers on the property. Uh, given the photographs provided by uh, complainants and the documents that Mr. Bartley submitted to me, I could not substantiate more than six appearances. There, there appeared to be more than six vehicle visits but based upon his records and the photographs I had, I could not substantiate more than six customer visits, so I did drop that portion uh, of the uh, complaint from our, from the Coast Department standpoint. Um, so that permit was reinstated for a second time. On March 24th, I asked for some additional information, uh, which which questions came out of my mind dealing with the answers provided by the council 
uh, by her counsel and affidavit submitted by on behalf of Ms. Foster uh, and Ms. Uh, Jacqueline Demers were the two affidavits that I had received at that time. Uh, Mr. Mr. Bartley uh, provided some additional information in response to that and based upon the photographs I had as well as the affidavits that Ms. Uh, Foster replied to uh, uh, in her affidavit, I revoked the permit for a final time on April the uh, 9th. Um, yeah. Ms. Joey, what is the, what is the reason now, actually, yeah, actually, the, the underlying reason that, that they are not in, uh, eligible for a sure. permit? Uh, Ms. Foster and her, both her affidavit and Ms. Demir's affidavit, um, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, ma'am, um, stated that they used a third party entity known as Butler's Bailey's Pet Service for pickup and delivery of clients' dogs. Uh, this was the entity in which they were originally cited for operating out of this location. Uh, in the affidavits, Ms. Foster is one third owner of that company. So in her own affidavit, she mentions in which they, she's contracted with Butler Bailey's to go get the client dogs, to pick them up, bring them to the property, have their, you know, have the service perform and then take them back. The issue I had with it is that this, this uh, carrier or courier service came to Ms. Foster's property, parked their personal vehicles, got into a vehicle owned by Ms. Foster and the grooming service, and then used that vehicle to pick up and deliver. And so based upon that and the fact that Ms. Foster is a partial owner of the other business, uh, I, I, decided, I made a determination that all of these individuals are employees of Ms. Foster's uh, either. And as such, she would be violating uh, having more than one uh, employee that does not reside on the premises. And then that, and that's something that you personally witnessed when you investigated? I did not personally witness, but based upon the, the information su supplied okay. by the appellant, Okay. The appellant's counsel and photographs from neighbors that, that that is the basis upon which I made that final determination in which this appeal spawned. Um, has since the filing, excuse me, <clears throat> of the appeal, counsel has submitted additional affidavits that I have not, you know, I, I didn't make a decision upon since he had already filed the appeal. I'd leave that in the board's hands to make a decision whether an error was placed on my part for revoking. But a permit could, if a permit had more than, if, or if a homeowner had more than one business, or if they had more than one employee, those are both, or they had more than six customers come in a day, that, those are all reasons that this permit could be revoked? That's correct, sir. Those are violations of the, of the ordinance itself, both in, um, and let me read what, during this time, it says employees and vehicles under the home occupation, no more than one part-time or full-time employee not living within the dwelling may work at the home occupation location. Not more than five employees may reside in the dwelling for a home occupation. So if these employees all lived on the premises, then I would have no violation. I know that seems a bit opposite of, of, of what, what uh, A says, but the council does allow resident employees up to five. Um, to operate a home occupation. Um, so in, in your interpretation, is the, is the, you're allowed to have one employee mean that you can only have one employee regardless of who employs that employee? Because what, what they're saying is that they had this, uh, a related courier service. And I know there was common ownership, but are you... Is your interpretation of that, if, if those c people working for the courier service were indeed employees of the courier service, that the, the ordinance prevents employees of other companies? In, so in I'm, this I'm with you about the one em only one employee. No, I follow your question. Are you defining that as one employee of, I think it's Happy Paws, is the LLC that Correct. operates? two of them, there was Hungry Paul's and then there was Butler Bailey's. For us, from my standpoint of the revocation is based upon those, as Ms. Foster is both owner of Hungry Paul's, the, the grooming service, 
and partial owner of the thing. She's essentially contracting with herself for a delivery company, both, both by photographs and by affidavits submitted by the applicant show that there was not only the, the groomer, Miss Luke, present, but also one of these couriers present at the premises at the same time. Because in their own uh, affidavits, they, they mentioned that these couriers come to the property, park their personal vehicles, get in the Hungry Paws vehicle to deliver uh, the, the client customers. So for, for me, if it were an ind truly an independent party, there's no need for them to drive to the premises, get in the other company's vehicle to drive the client dogs back and forth and then get back into their personal vehicles. And if it was a truly uh, completely separated entity, uh, you wouldn't have those vehicles come in and park in. So there wouldn't be sort of the commingling of activity going on here. So for me, I, I looked at those courier employees as being Ms. Foster's employees, employees yeah. because she's partial owner of both. Now, um, I don't, I, I admit that the council didn't run that when they come up this scenario, but it seems a bit odd to me that a courier service would use a third, an, another entity's vehicles to do their couriering. You know, if they're a true courier service, they'd have their own vehicles. They, they, they could bring the client dogs to and for. And I've told Ms. Foster's counsel, there's nothing in the home occupation ordinance that permits either she or her one employee, Ms. Luke, to go get dogs, bring them back, take them back. They could do it a hundred times a day. Those do not come as customer visits. But if they were to use this courier service to do that, when that courier comes, that's a visit. That's a customer visit. You're essentially bringing that in there because you've contracted with this third party. If they truly are an independent entity, those would be customer visits for the coach department. Because the whole point of this restriction is to stop that in and out traffic in the neighborhood coming and going. So that, those were the basis in my letter I actually wrote. And I'll read from it. And then I had one other question. Were the complaints made by one or more neighbors? They were, there were multiple neighbors that emailed the Coast Department. Uh, there's, there was one complainant who, who photographed frequently uh, car trips coming in and out of the premises some of which I looked at and I could see uh, some of some of Ms. Foster's employees here today. I, I know that's them when I see them coming in and out and where they're parking. But other photographs submitted were dark. I couldn't substantiate. At the end of the day, uh, Mr. Pepper, I, I could not tie more than six customer visits based off the, the, uh, the client's logs, which they're required to keep versus the, the neighbor's photographs. But uh, in your opinion, though, if, if there were four customer visits documented through cars and three more courier visits that would you would consider that to be seven i would sir yes sir. okay now I, taking into account the the nature of this business understanding there's a there's a there's a take two there and drop off and then there's a subsequent later pickup i'm not counting those as two visits that in my mind that would be one in out that's kind of one transaction to take care of okay um it, it's a little bit different in that that uh, personal care services here in this, uh, we're dealing with, with non-humans, you know, so there's, if the, the owner of the dog's not staying at the residence waiting for the groomer to cut them, uh, what I've seen, in, in, at least in the photographs, there's a back and forth that occurs here. And so in deference to the, the, the applicant for it, I'm giving her the benefit of a doubt, there's a drop off into the subsequent pickup. Uh, so some of, the, some of the photographs that may have been submitted by neighbors shows, you know, 16 car trips. Well, you know, it's a, I'm, I'm giving the benefit of the doubt that there's eight visits potentially current. And I originally cited her for that. But the records that her counsel submitted uh, satisfied me that, that they were not exceeding customer visits. So it really hinges down in this case, and uh, counsel's you know, submitted that, that you know, this is an entirely separate entity. You know, they're, they're not employees of hers. I, we're just not convinced. that think there's, there's enough there that they are actually one and the same. So you're saying the the, the hungry paws and the, and the other LLC, the courier service, which is Butler Bailey's. You're, you're saying you've seen documents that lead you to conclude they're first, they're one and the same. Based upon the the affidavit submitted by the appellants themselves, uh, mentioned the functionality of that courier service was that the the call would come either to um, would come to the courier. They would drive their personal vehicles to the Bramblewood property, then transfer into a, a vehicle owned by the grooming company to then carry those animals back and forth. 
and then back in their personal vehicles to go back from whence they came. And to me, there's, that, that's, you're, they're working for you. They are your employee. You've hired them to come do this job for you. Now, from a Secretary of State standpoint, it lists that she's one third owner of that company. Uh, to me, that's, you know, that she's hired Miss Luke to be the groomer. She's hired Mr. Mirrors to, uh, and, and, and uh, Mr. I forget him, I apologize, I have his name here with me. Um, Uh, she's hired other employees to make these courier runs for her. Um, so for, you know, after, after a review of what was submitted, and I know the council submitted subsequent documents, affidavits from uh, these employees saying, you know, that they're employed by the, the courier. At that point, once the appeal's filed, I, I'm leaving it to you all to decipher if, whether you agree with us or agree with the council. Um, well, and I saw the affidavit about the, there being employees of separate entities, and you're saying you, just, you didn't have that, Mr. Hargis, before, uh, I believe the applicant's mother submitted an affidavit, uh, Carla Foster did, and yep. she states that Ms. Mears and Ben Stover are also employees of Butler Bailey's. And then when they were doing Butler Bailey's courier service work, they were paid by Butler Bailey's. And then if they were doing work for Hungry Paul's, they were paid by Hungry Paul's. Did you have that information before your revocation? Yeah, I, not, I did not have um, uh, her mother's affidavit nor the, uh, the gentleman's affidavit. Only Ms. Foster's and Mr. Murr's. And I, I, from what you're telling me, that is that is uh, akin to what they've they've stated in their own affidavits. For instance. Uh, I cited in my revocation letter uh, Ms. Foster's own statement in her first affidavit. Uh, this, would, this would be Ms. Stephanie Foster's affidavit. That on the occasion that, that and I'm reading from her affidavit, on the occasion where Mr. Mears is acting as a dog courier, her time is paid and she is charged as an employee of Hungry Paws or by Butler Bailey's Pet Services, the LLC, a separate company that operates out of Williamson County, depending on where the transportation request originates. Uh, when she, when Ms. Demers is is acted as a pet sitter on my personal uh, behalf, she's paid for by Butler Bailey's um, service. So, and then and she goes on to state that she does some IT and administrative work that is remote from that. Remote work's fine. I'm not, you know, the, the, since the ordinance specifies only one outside employee may be working on the premises. The point at which Miss Luke was present, um, or Mr. Mirrors, or um, or the uh, subsequent affidavit that we got from Mr. Stover. Uh, anytime they were both there together in our mind is a violation of this ordinance. Okay, and, and then last question. If we, will, if we uphold the revocation, what is the period that that revocation is? When, when, when and if ever, can they reapply? Uh, under the home occupation section, um, I believe that there's a one year, um, let me get the exact section. One day, a one year from the date of revocation of the ordinance, which would be April 9th in this in this instance. This is the this permit was revoked multiple times. Thank you. Yep. And and let me say for the record too, uh, the initial revocation by me, um, and, and Mr. Bartley was right to point out, I, I should have presented Ms. Foster the opportunity to say, look, here are the charges against you. Uh, here's here's the spelled out list of the issues that are before us. You know, give her an opportunity to answer, uh, and then make a decision. Uh, that re that first revocation, I did reinstate her permit for 14 days to allow them to submit some thing, and then reinstated it a second time to allow them to provide additional information. Um, so, to to the extent that that mistake had occurred, uh, I, I do admit that that did occur. So, but we're, at the end of the day, where we ended up. Uh, no violations on the customers. Um, some of the neighbors here may testify otherwise, but that is that is not in front of the board. Um, what is is whether this revocation based upon the number of employees was either correct or incorrect. Um, and of course, the coach department will do whatever you direct. Okay. So, 
Mr. Chairman, if I could. Yep, Mr. Chairman, Mr. One, one point of clarification, if I could, Mr. Wallace. Uh, what is not and more to remind in the opposition present, not before this board is whether the permit should have been issued to begin with. Uh, that is not in front of this board. Um, so, and I'll are, are there other questions for the zoning staff? I mean, I, yes. I know that was a lot of information and it's a complicated case, yeah. but I just want to make, we've always uh, really kind of exhausted a lot of the questions here before we turned it over to the uh, public. Yeah. Mr. Wallace. If, if, can, Mr. Harkins, I just want to make sure that I understand that there were at least two separate LLCs that had common employees. Is, is, is that what I'm understanding you to say? So say the, the groomer may have delivered some, some of the, the animals while working as the courier service and then would proceed to, to groom, and that would be the other Happy Paws or whatever the name is, and excuse me if I have that wrong. I'm just making sure. So part-time they may be working for one of the LLCs and the other part-time they, you know, sort of like you've got two people in one body, so to speak, doing two different, working for two different entities. Am I understanding that's your understanding? That, that is my understanding, Mr. Lawless, in, okay. in, in the sense that those, those individual employees may be employees of both entities. Uh, what, I, what I'm alleging is that their presence on the premises is a violation of the ordinance. Okay. Either, and, either, and, and they're I'm, both there for one company or both there for separate companies, is still a violation. Yeah. Un understood. There, and, and I'm sure that Mr. Council is looking forward without any question to the questions he's going to get in a few minutes. Sure. Uh, but and did you have an opportunity to ascertain whether or not both of the LLCs were properly licensed or were paying their taxes and, and F&E and all that other? The, the original citation by the Property Standards Division with it was that there were two businesses operating from this premises. Uh, there was information given to us that, that brought forth that abate notice. Uh, it was remedied in submittals by the attorney's counsel showing Secretary of State records that the courier service was indeed based out of Williamson County, which such we, we removed that. Uh, kind of a follow-up to your previous question. There, to the point, to the extent that Ms. Foster is, is owner of, Porsche owner of both companies, in my mind, those employees under her are all her employees. So if they are both present at the premises, is a violation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, to the appellant, if you would uh, state your name, address, and tell us why the zoning administrator uh, erred in this case. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Keen Bartley, 3310 West End, Suite 460 is my business address. I live in Bellevue, Tennessee, so I'm also a county resident. Yet we're here, and you heard a little bit of it from the description of Mr. Hargis. The problem that has occurred in this case is at each step of the way, there's been a revocation that had to be set aside because there wasn't adequate opportunity to address the issues that were being raised by zoning. That's exactly what's happened in this case and why we're here today. Because what has occurred is a revocation is issued and then afterwards you're told why or in the revocation told why you're being having the permit revoked the errors that occurred and i think they've been hit on there are two separate llc's in this that are of question in here hungry falls llc has certified dog groomers of which miss foster is one miss foster's resided at this property since 2005. Both of these uh, LLCs predated the uh, request for a permit by years. So both of these companies existed and operated prior to uh, the request for the, uh, the home occupation permit. The Hungry Paws LLC employs groomers. Butler Bailey's Pet Services does not. So there's, it's not a case of a groomer working for two companies. Anyone who is performing work for Butler Bailey Services, as we've submitted any affidavits, and I, I gather they've all made it, and I've got all the folks who submitted those affidavits here today, if there are questions for them, 
but the folks working for Butler Bailey's do not engage in grooming. They engage in either pet courier services, pet sitting services, um, or pet walking services. It is a business that operates on a part-time basis as needed. Uh, it is not contracted with Hungry Paws. There is no contract where they're the exclusive uh, provider for uh, transportation to this site. If I'd known that was an issue before today, I could have cleared that up. Uh, they, they are free to work for whoever would call them, and quite frankly, I could have one of the people testify today. She had a meeting she had to cancel working for Butler Bailey's at 2 o'clock to do pet services that had nothing to do with Hungry Paws. Those business operate separately. Do they have com some common ownership? Yes. Ms. Foster is a minority owner, 33% of both companies. The remainder of the companies, both of them are owned by someone else. Now, now but now this, but the, the, they're owned by her parents, which yes. is in the testimony. And then her parents also in their uh, affidavit said that they had invested heavily in Hungry Paws. And so is there a common ownership with the parents yes, and Hungry parents, Paws? Yes, both of the companies are family-owned companies by the mother, the father, and the child. And then do, uh, what other pet grooming businesses does Butler Bailey provide courier services to? We strictly... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, since you just spoke first time, state your name Stephanie and address. Stephanie Foster, and address is 415 Bramblewood Drive. Um, Butler Bailey services all of Nashville. So they get a, a call from hotels downtown that are requesting courier services to different groomers. It just varies. It's, it's as needed basis. Um, that's, I, I don't know if I answered your question. I, well, I mean, I, I just asked who, who do they do business with, and you gave me an answer, so okay. that was. So, Mr. Bartley, but it didn't also, I mean, two of these employees, it's not just common ownership, two of these employees were employed both by Hungry Paws and by the courier service, right? And that, that to me, is just, that's just fraught with peril if you're trying to untease this. And, and, and I also think there's some, there's some real inconsistencies in these, in these affidavits that were submitted you know, for example, um, Ms. Foster says in her affidavit that, that when Ms. Demers was there on December 7th, she was solely working for me in my individual capacity. Then I look at Ms. Demers' affidavit and she says that she was paid by Butler Bailey's LLC for that. And, and they're, they're and, I, and I'm not, I don't think anybody was trying to, I don't have any information that anybody was trying to be intentionally misleading, but there, there are, these affidavits are, have numerous inconsistencies, consistencies, and, and to me, I mean, if these if these folks are employed by Hungry Paws, it, saying, well, they can be over here because they're not working for Hungry Paws when they're also part-time employees of, of Hungry Paws, that's just, um, I, I think that's really hard for me to swallow. The other thing is, I mean, t two of these employees say, well, we work for Hungry Paws, and we do administrative work, and we work on the computers, and we do all this other stuff, but we do it remotely. And I know some amount of work can be done remotely, but if you're, if you're in charge of somebody's computer system and all the other things they say they were in charge of, it seems to me like at some point you've got to go on site and, and do things. So um, I, I, I would not be able to, let me answer the first question sure. first, the affidavits. The problem was when we submitted records to Mr. Hargis, they were accounting records. They were, they were, it was a ledger sheet. We determined that Ms. Foster had mistakenly billed the pet sitting services by Ms. Demers to Hungry Paws when she actually was paid by Butler Bailey. It was a mistake and it was simply a matter of trying to be transparent and tell the truth. Uh, she, it, there is a entry in the ledger that showed that she was paid by Hungry Paws, which has been corrected. Uh, at the time that ledger was submitted, uh, Ms. Foster's mother, the CPA, had not looked over that ledger and would have immediately seen that's not supposed to be charged that way. You've got to pay for that individually. 
She was, part, she was watching Miss Foster's dog as a pet sitter, just what Butler Bailey's Pet Services does. That's, and it was simply to clarify a charge that looked like, and I may have made it more confusing, but there was an attempt to give an accurate response because that's what occurred. Um, as to there being confusion, it is confusing. It could be, but the, these people are t informed that when they're working for one company, they keep the record straight, so they make sure they're charged to the right company, so withholding is made properly, so they're covered by the right insurance, and that things are, are all done to the letter uh, when you have companies which may be somewhat affiliated but not necessarily affiliated. And it's, it is confusing, and it is, but even so, if, we, if there was a truly independent delivery service, we wouldn't be here. It's, it's, no, it's really no different whether there's a partial ownership of it or it is a completely separate divorced company, the same services are being provided. Um, and, and, and as long as the business uh, methods and the requirements are followed, proper filings are followed, We've got the CTA make sure they're charged to the right places. The W-2s are filed to the right companies. They are separate, independent companies. And, they, and during the time when those employees are working part-time for this company that can only provide part-time work because there's not enough work for full-time, that those part-time services are provided by part-time laborers that may also do something else that moonlight, like a lot of people are having to do in this economy. Could you remind me, who, who is Emily Luke? Emily Luke is right here. No, I mean, I mean but what, does she live at the home, or is she an employee of the... At this time, both. As of May 1st, I understand she does reside at the, the, the house. For at the time, at the initial time, she did not. So, but now... Oh, sorry. So uh, when you provided, uh, or when some, I, I'll assume it was you all provided the uh, appointment log for Hungry Paws, I mean, it, it looks like that, and this was from the first, maybe the first of October through March, uh, October last year through March of this year. It looks like Emily did a, a majority of the grooming, and so was she an Employee, were they? I guess were they both employees at that time? And Emily didn't live there. I mean, uh, she was an employee at that time and did not reside on the premises, as I understand, until May first. Okay, is that correct? Okay. And then I, I know you. I just ask ask one last question, and, and before you proceed, but there's an awful lot of folks associated with this business. I mean, I've got, you know, the. Uh, the mom does the billing and the accounting, and there are two other people that have sworn uh, or sent affidavits that do administrative work. There are two people that are employed uh, grooming dogs, uh, I mean, including Stephanie and Emily, and yet there's no more than six dogs a day. That's a lot of employees for just six dogs a day. Is that really, I mean, and again, we're not here about someone's business efficiency or anything else like that, but it sure does look like on paper this is a much bigger operation than what's shown. Help me understand why so many people are involved in such little business. Well, that would presume that all the work was being done at the premises, which it's not. A, a lot of the work, is, as we have said in the affidavits, are, are being done remotely. And no, I'm, I'm, that's not my question. My question is, why does it take six people to administer a business that only has six customers a day? Um, they perform different functions. The groomers groom, the groomers don't drive, the groomers don't pet sit, the groomers don't walk dogs. Except, okay. Except when they are pet sitting or... Well, the person who was pet sitting was not a groomer. Right. No, I mean, she wasn't a groomer. Uh, Ms. Demers is not a groomer. The two okay. groomers are, are Ms. Foster and Ms. Luke. Okay. They are the only groomers. And who are the people that work for... Action? Then who are the people specifically that work for the two different companies? Um... Uh, well, I would Ms. Demers, but when she's not, when she's working for Hungry Paws, she's doing something besides grooming. And when she's working for the courier service, she's either sitting or driving. 
that would, or pet sitting or driving. That would be two people, Miss Miss uh, Demers and uh, Mr. Stover. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, and I know we we started asking questions and and and, and halted your presentation, so I apologize for that. Oh, no, that's fine. I'd really really just soon get to the heart of the matter because right. we believe, you know, I. I I made a really long statement that y'all probably don't want to hear, uh, but <laughs> Mr. Ross right. would know I can, <laughs> I can wax. But uh, the long and short of it is, the although this is complicated and it may be more complicated and more people than is often uh, surround a small business, because there are in fact two separate businesses. Uh, under these circumstances, the only issues really were their violations while the uh, operations were taking place from 415 Bramblewood. We would submit, and we have shown by affidavits of the, the folks that are here, and we, I believed we had shown it previously like we have with every other allegation that has been made about how this business is being run, which runs from them running a commercial breeding facility to them making retail sales from the premises to having too many customer visits when they were taking people were taking pictures of social visitors to the property of relatives coming to visit the property and claiming they were customers uh, this has become a real teapot in the tempest because the actual facts and the unrebutted facts I would submit and we've got the, the folks have put in affidavits under oath subject to perjury that during the times they were on the premises, if they were a Butler Bailey employee, they were, and they were working, they were working for Butler Bailey's, they were not working for Hungry Paws. But, but some of those, they, I mean, and, I, and again, I don't think it was intentionality, but I think it, it shows the problem when you've got employees that are working for two different companies. They're inconsistent. I mean, at one point, you know, we're told that when Ms. Demers is there on December 7th, she's paid by, um, she's working individually for the applicant, then later she says it's Butler Bailey's, and there are other inconsistencies in there, and I mean, I, I, my, I think that it, it, at the very least it doesn't comply with the spirit of, of what this permit particularly allows your client to do, and I, I'm inclined to, to uphold the uh, decision of the administrator. My question would be if, we were to consider permitting your client to reapply sooner than one year, what, what could we be assured of that would that what? your client could do to make sure that we don't get into the situation again? Because it, it's, it, to me, it's unworkable to have two employees who work for two different companies who have common ownership. That, that's just, that is gonna result, no, nobody can untease when they're working for who, I don't think. Um, so, you know, my question is, and I, and I, and I think we're, we are, there were a lot, I, I get that there were a lot of accusations made by neighbors, but Mr. Horius has said it very clearly, we're down to one issue, and, and that is, was there more than one full-time employee working there uh, at any given time? And I, I'm seeing inconsistencies in these affidavits where these folks aren't even, they're, they're changing their position about who they were working for. So what is it? What is it that we? What is it that could be done going forward to um, assure that we don't have this problem again? Were we to consider? I don't know how. I don't. Yeah. I mean, I'm not speaking for the other members of the board. I'll just tell you that I'm inclined to think the zoning administrator did not make a mistake, and that y your client did get a, a fair hearing on all of this. That particularly based on the inconsistencies in these affidavits, and it's just. It's just. Again, you're, you're, you're asking for trouble when you're saying we've got two commonly owned companies and we've got two employees that work sometime for this company, sometime for this company, but just every time they're over here, they're, they're not working for Hungry Paws, they're working for the other company. So what is, it, what is it that could be done going forward? And I also understand, you know, you're, they're going, there's going to be traffic coming to your, your 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 client's house and I understand that upsets the neighbors also get that's just that's not what we're here today to decide they're going to be there could be you know people hmm. coming over for social visits and other things but what about the issue of the employees well I, I guess the first problem I got Mr. Pepper is legally 
they are separate entities. Legally, they are employees of two separate entities when they're performing those duties. And that is what the standard should be when applying an ordinance is what is it legally? Is it sloppy? Is it complicated? Certainly is. But the point being, if the structures are followed, that is the legal basis for uh, operating in this manner. Is it complicated in the, the preferred method? No. Uh, is there a, if the, if it is a, the, the zoning board's position that you cannot have an affiliated company uh, servicing a property at the peril of your losing your permit, I imagine there's a lot of businesses in town that would be at peril. Uh, this is not the only business in town that uses affiliated businesses and may even use common employees. I know it's common in construction, it's common in the entertainment and hospitality industries. People may work for different entities. But if, that, if it is the case, that this, pro this process is not acceptable to use this company for uh, courier services, they won't use that company for courier services. That's fine. If that's gonna be the requirement, these folks wanna make a living. That's, they're here because in the several weeks since this ruling came down, these folks have not been allowed to make a living. And that's what we're here about is because this ordinance was passed to allow people to work from their homes and make a living that were impacted by the economic downturn that occurred. And that is what is not happening today and hasn't been happening since this uh, revocation went into effect on April 16th. And if it is the judgment of the board that, that this has to be done by using another independent courier service that has nothing to do with these two folks, that's they will follow that. They want to get reopened and making a living. May I just ask a couple of questions? And again, Mr. Barkley, I'm going to pull you back to the two LLCs maintain separate business records. They have separate, and I'm, I'm, I know yes. that your client's yes. nodding her head up and yes. down, and I'm just for the record, and I realize that we're on tape and what have you, um, and, and two separate payrolls. And most of the employees work part-time for one or the other. Yeah. Okay. Two, two of the employees work part-time for the other. Okay. Well, and, and, but they're segregated out that way. Right. They maintain... I guess, little cards. They what about cards. benefits? What about benefits? Do they have insurance with both of them? No. Okay. Just with one. All right. So from a legal standpoint, you've got the Secretary of State that's both have been filed their annual reports. They've filed, they've got their EINs, and, and I'm... Good the, well, and, and this is one of those wonderful things you've got a couple of lawyers on this group, and like in all things in life, lawyers never agree except to disagree. And, and I'm looking at this as if it was someone coming to one of my financial institutions that I represent, and they were making a loan, and they were doing those types of things, they would, you'd require them to, to basically be tied. And that's what I'm hearing you say. Now, I realize you've got a whole lot of people out in the, the audience here today that are going to think I'm leaning one way or the other, and I'm still listening, mind you. But I'm having a hard time. I, I, I'm not going to talk about the efficiency of the company. That's her problem. That's not our problem up here. The optics are bad. I mean, it really does. You've got to, and I've been the one that's picked on animals for a long time. It seems like, you know, last, last meeting, I was the one came to the defense of the, 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 the dog keeper place. So I, I'm, I'm flipping around this time. Uh, but only six dogs? I mean, that, that, and I understand what Mr. Pepper is saying and, and uh, what the chairman is, is saying. So, I mean, that, when you get back into your time, you might want to jump into that a little bit because that seems to be a hole in, in this that you may be able to plug that helps 
Mr. Pepper a little bit. I don't know, but I, I'm. And so you need to yeah, turn your mic. Thank you. Thank you. There is one thing that I guess I don't know that's really relevant. Let me, let me ask if I can make a disclosure. Mm -hmm. Ms. Foster, as we alluded in the, to when her business folded, uh, she was released from a rather adhesive uh, franchise agreement which barred her from providing any pet grooming services other than from her residence. So there is no alternative for her to perform her functions other than from her home. It, can I ask that there is like a limit, is there like a time limit on that? Would that, would that expire at some point? Two years. May have been violated, but you know, that's. There any other questions for the applicant at this point? And I, Mr. Bartley, I, let me say, I, 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 I agree your client has the, the right to, oh, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Please, Mr. Please finish, Mr. Pepper. I can wait. It's okay, I didn't know you were about to speak. So, yeah, and Ashanti, I'm sorry, I can't. I can't see the red light on your. It's, it's hidden by the thing, so I, I didn't see that signal. I apologize. That's okay. No, please, Mr. Pepper. Please, I didn't mean. Sure. To I mean, your, your client has every right to operate the business out of her place. I just, I do think that that since it's a home business, the the, the neighbors also have a right to make sure your client adheres to to. The, the very letter of what she's supposed to be doing. And I think that this having common ownership and common employees has, has created a real problem. I also think Mr. Hargis pointed out, and your client stated in an affidavit before it was retracted in another affidavit that, that uh, Hungry Paws was providing the company vehicle that was used by the, the courier service. That's just, and, and that's, I think if your client can eliminate those kind of things and, and put herself in a position where those kind of uh, questions can't be raised, then, you know, I, I just want to say on the record, I'm not trying to put her out of business, but also do think the neighbors have every right to make sure that things are being run exactly the way they're supposed to be run. And I, and I don't think they have. I think these employees have, when you work for two different employers, you, you, and you're at one place of employment, you're, I mean, the distinction goes away in my mind. So at any rate, that's what I wanted to say to you. I'm sorry, Ms. Davis, I think I interrupted you. May I respond to him before, if you're going to ask a question? I, I'm not trying to cut you off, but I just, I don't want to forget that, to respond to something that he has said. As I think was delineated regarding the vehicle, that hasn't been used since the end of December for pet delivery. So that has already resolved itself. Nobody's coming there, parking their car and using the vehicle. That was before the first complaint was even issued by zoning. Um, and as far as the confusion, I would just point out that the only time the Butler Bailey's employees are present on this premises working are if they're acting as a courier or a dog sitter. That's the only time, the only way they would be at this address is in in route either to drop off or pick up a dog or it, in the one occasion. And it was one occasion where uh, Ms. Demers acted as a pet, a, a pet sitter for Ms. Foster personally, not for the business, for her personal pet. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm not gonna, I'll wait. Ms. Nelson, that was cool. No, I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and uh, need your mic on. I yeah. think we've hashed our issues, and I would reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal. Okay. Sure. Any any other questions for the applicant at this point? Just one point of clarification: that the the clock ran a little bit on an answer session. I, I think Mr. King should be allowed five and a half uh, to to respond in his rebuttal. Okay. Uh, we made an error there, and apologize for that. All right. Then we will have. Uh, if you all would uh, leave the podium and the members of the uh, the folks who are here in opposition who Mr. would like to speak and and, and, and Council Lady, you can speak again if you want to speak after everything's done. 
if, whenever you choose to speak, just raise your hand, wave at me, and we'll, and we'll have you come up and talk. Hey, Mr. Chairman? And if you choose not to speak, that's your right, too. I know I'm not trying to put you on the spot. just want to make sure you knew. Mr. Chairman, yes, would, it, would it be possible as a point of personal privilege to four or five minutes take a break? Yeah, is there anybody object to a quick break? We'll break for four minutes, and uh, then as, as we're doing that, if you all want to decide who's going to speak and then uh, come to the podium, and we'll start as soon as we get back. And Mr. Chairman, naturally, we'll remind the board members not to discuss any facets of the case during your break. Thank you. We will reconvene in just a few minutes. Sir, if you will press the button, turn the mic on, and state your name and address, and why well, you're here. Okay, sure. Um, my name is George Andrews. I live at, uh, my family uh, lives next door to the appellant in a house um, we've, I've lived in for nearly 20 years, and it's been in my family since it was built in 1955. Um, we oppose this appeal, and evidence should make it clear why. We believe that the appellant has not only shown a pattern of violating the ordinance, but also a disregard for the impact of her business and customers have on her immediate neighbors. Those that don't live within sight of the house have no idea what it's like to look out of your front window and see customers, employees, dropping off dogs, picking up dogs, coming and going all day long, six days a week. They don't know what it's like to have their kids not want to play outside or take a walk until the neighbors next door leave. Uh, they don't know how it feels to have no choice but to report your neighbor or to keep curtains closed or perhaps even move. Um, we've seen uh, more than six customers a day, customers before 8 a.m., customers on Sundays, customers wait around in the owner's yard, uh, customers parked in the street, customers parked in the yard, customers turning around in other neighbors' driveways, customers walking their dogs in other neighbors' yards, um, and not to mention the three employees working from the house. All of those things have occurred multiple times. Every complaint made was met, uh, backed by evidence from neighbors, um, not codes inspectors, not private investigators, but people who never expect to be uh, living um, next to a business. Um, we believe that the track record of violations combined with the significant investment made in the home addition make it unlikely she will become compliant or afford to remain, remain compliant for long, and then uh, who will monitor her then? Um, should you grant our appeal, we believe you'll be sending a message that anything goes, that rules don't matter, and they won't be enforced. Um, please protect our residential zone. Uphold the uh, zoning administrator's revocation of this home occupation permit. Thank you. And I, have, I do have a, a question. You said um, you, you heard what the appellant had testified in terms of how the business works and, and the... Um, courier service and that, that you have one of the folks that comes and drops off dogs and if they do that, that's their business and they're part of this company and um, the other folks are the hungry paws. And is it, what, what are you seeing? How, how is what you're seeing and experiencing? And I know you sent a lot of pic or not, I don't know if you personally, but there's a lot of pictures that were submitted in our packet uh, that I think were taken by neighbors. But tell me your experience and what you see. Um, you, you labeled a lot of things, but explain just on a daily basis. You know, who, who's coming? How do you know there are three employees? What do you see in terms of the courier dropping off dogs? You, when you say that, give me a few examples of, of some of the things that you talked about to help me relate to it more personally. Well, um, I'll say that we, we um, when we're able, I work full time, obviously, I'm back in the office now. Um, but when we're able, we tried to photograph everything that was in place, and we, and we made sure, and in our opinion, we made sure that we were um, uh, providing um, accurate information. Um, you know, it, it, when they say it's like a, a, a friend or acquaintance visiting or something like that, well, that, that is hard for us to determine, but if they're carrying a dog, then there, we assumed they were a client. Okay, that could be wrong. Um, but uh, there was a lot to just, um, again, we tried to document everything if, if neighbors were, or if they were turning around in driveways. Um, um, one of the neighbors who's here can attest to um, having them turn around in their driveway. 
And then did um, you ever see more than six dogs come and go in a day? Is that what you're? Um, I, it's, it's documented when we did. Again, I, I work full time. Okay. So I was, if, it's, if we did, it's documented. And we, never, we didn't speculate on anything. Okay. Um, so um, uh, uh, just weekend days, just days would be a lot to traffic. It, 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 I know it's not part of this process of trying to uh, say that six, six visits um, are allowed, or six customers are allowed, but that's essentially 12 vehicles on an already street that's a cut through. It's an extremely uh, impactful uh, business on the existing neighbors. And we're not even one of the, the neighbors that feels it the most, but certainly we don't live right next to it. Um, but we're uh, in, in plain sight of it. Okay. Any, any other questions for this fellow? All right. Did you have anything else to add, or were other folks? No, no, no. Okay. Hi, my name is Michelle Montez. I live at 341 Fieldcrest. Um, I just want to reiterate that um, I'm a school teacher in the neighborhood, and we teach our students to follow rules and procedures without trying to bend them. And I think there's a very clear indication that rules were attempted to be bent and broken, and I feel like if you allow it, it sends a message to any other businesses that want to come in that you can bend and break the rules no matter how much it's affecting the neighbors and nothing will get done. So I'm hoping that you will hear us and that you will, um, you know, understand our concerns. Thank you. Okay. My name is Lisa Valentine. I live on Bramblewood Drive. I oppose reinstating the business license, the permit. It's clear from the permit history that the homeowner's intent was to build an addition onto their home for the sole purpose of running their business and housing their employees. One has already moved in. That on top of the allowed six customer visits per day, that totals 12 car visits each day. That's not appropriate in a neighborhood setting. We have pictures that have documented more than six customers per day, which means even if there's seven, that means 14 visits per day. That's 14 cars. Car in, stay, car out. I've witnessed people waiting on the street, like uh, Mr. Andrews said, people waiting on the street with their dogs, playing in the yard, cars parked in the yard. That's not something that I want to see in my neighborhood. There's a business park less than 200 yards from Ms. Foster's home. That's exactly what it was designed for, whether she has a non-compete or not. The fact that she built a business, built a structure for the sole purpose of running her business means that after her non-compete is over, she has no intention of going to another storefront. She's gonna remain exactly where she is and proceed as she has been violating rules. The right of Ms. Foster to run a business out of her home does not outweigh the right of every other neighbor in our neighborhood to live in a quiet residential neighborhood, which is where we bought property, or if you rent property there. It's our right to live in a quiet residential neighborhood, not another Berry Hill. Thank you. Hello, I'm Joanne Crowell, and I own the house two doors down, but on the other side of the street. And I hear a lot of yip, 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 all these dogs. And I see people walking up and down, waiting for their appointments. And I just think we, we bought in this neighborhood too. We enjoy the peace and quiet. And it's not tending to be that way. So, Ma'am, have you, and I asked the, uh, uh, the fellow that was up here a little bit ago, and, and I, have you, you said you've seen people waiting for their appointments. Have you personally seen more than six folks come and go in a day uh, with a dog, or are, are there, are there and, and I understand, and I'm not trying to, to cut you off, but I, I'm trying to get to some testimony of 
the neighbors where they've seen, uh, you know, the actual violations. And I, I know you've talked about the number, or not you, but other people talked about the number of cars. You talked about um, uh, the inconvenience and the traffic and, and that type of thing. But I'm trying to also get to uh, what are some of the specific things that, that they violated that were against the ordinance? Because I know a lot of you referenced the ordinance. And so just tell us what you, you from your perspective, what they've done that they shouldn't be doing in terms of the number of employees or the number of pets and that kind of thing. I can't testify because I'm not there all the time. Right. So, but I've seen a log where a neighbor has kept all these cars coming back and forth, back and forth, different cars. And, uh, you know, it's just not, um, um, the peace and quiet that we used to enjoy or on Maywood Drive has been di disrupted. Okay. Any thank questions you. for this applicant? This person. All right, thank you. Hello, I'm Joan Andrews. I live at 4901 Maywood Drive. Um, I'm married to Mr. Andrews. And um, I'm the primary person who's taken the photographs of the customers and the employees coming and going. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Are you the keeper of the log? The keeper of the log, yes. And so, do, through, so from your observation, so it sounds like you've been very observant. From your observation, you know, are there more than six customers coming uh, um, in a day? Are there more than uh, what you would consider? And again, we've heard the legal uh, corporation situation, but. Tell me who's coming and going and how many customers and what you've witnessed that you believe are in violation of the The number orders. of customers per day has decreased since, um, since they realized I was documenting the activity. Prior to around December 10th when um, Ms. Foster came over and spoke with us, that's when we saw more, um, more customers coming. And... Um, as far as the customers and, coming And was that more than six a day? There were a couple days when, yes, and, and as far as I could tell, and I tried to take photographs to show people holding dogs, it's not always easy. And, and she has had a lot of construction. I've always tried to um, ferret out what's construction, what's a customer. And there were days when, um, actually after revocation where there were people coming and it almost looked like they were trying to catch me documenting them or something anyway that I didn't document. Like if I didn't feel very confident that someone that was there as a customer, I didn't write it down. Um, and so the number of customers has decreased when those complaints were first filed as well. My interpretation of the ordinance, it says customer visits. It doesn't say six customers a day, but six customer visits a day. And I'm interpreting the customer as being the pet owner, not the actual pet. So in my mind, six customer visits, if a customer drops off, they leave, they come back, that was two visits. So when those complaints were first filed, that was under that interpretation. Right. So, and, and, I know, and I'm sorry, and I know there are other reasons that we heard from the code staff, and that may, this may not, the customers, I don't want to get too caught up on it. It may not okay. even be the basis, but I just, I just was curious. Again, and I, and I apologize for not uh, being probably uh, better spoken at, at what I was trying to get at from, from the audience. We started hearing how disruptive a, a home business is. And, and I appreciate that. I don't know that I would want this next to me, but that's not the question for this board. That, that was, you know, that's, that's not an issue for us. So right. I really wanted to get to why is the zoning administrator correct in revoking this, which goes to what are the rules that are, that are being broken? So that, that's, that is, that's what my goal was, and I'd ask a specific question for that, that that may or may not have been as relevant to what you wanted to say. So okay. I apologize for that. That's okay. Um, I'd just also like to say that I, there were other violations that I'm surprised weren't included that I again tried to document, which was customers before the 8 a.m. Um, that, that one, some 
Customers on Sunday, one, I wasn't able to document because I didn't think it would happen the first time I saw it when she walked out with two dogs delivering to a car on the road. And I didn't have, I didn't expect it, I didn't have my phone ready. Um, so when neighbors are the ones who have to enforce this or document this, it's really challenging to give you all court ready proof. And I was just doing my best to show what I was seeing. And as far as the employees being there, um, I, f I don't agree. I mean, they again, have, they've dialed back the, the um, employees from Butler Bailey's. They've dialed back their presence at the um, business. But early on, they were working there. They were um, meeting customers in the yard. They weren't there as chauffeurs. Not all, not all of them. Mr. Stover, I didn't see him meeting. He did seem more like a chauffeur, but, but he was there longer than just what I would have assumed a chauffeur would do. Um, and again, I don't know if you saw the pictures from the website. The website for the Paw Charmers, which was her dress, shows all of them in all of their different capacities for that address. Um, so I feel like the uh, zoning administrator right, made the correct determination. So your, your observation is, though, with the people that work there, regardless of what, what company may be signing their paycheck, but they were there frequently, often, and that there was an overlap in the folks that, that have been named as dropping off dogs in terms of dropping off dogs and maybe staying long, you know, being there longer than what you thought was appropriate for just someone dropping off a dog, going yes. to pick up another dog, coming back, taking that dog back, that kind of thing. Yes. Okay. Are there, um, Tom, did you have a question? Can you help me just a little bit uh, in, in looking at our map up there, the mm -hmm. photos, where exactly is, are you located when you're watching the people come in and out? I'm, I'm my front window, so I'm at 4901 Maywood Drive, which is the opposite corner. Okay. So my front window uh, on there looks out at her front window, and, um, and I can see the driveway to some, to some degree now. Um, but when the, when the business really started picking up, it was all, the traffic was really primarily coming through their front door, so I got to see a lot of it. Okay. And then... Exclusive of if, if someone dropped dog off and then came back later in the day and picked it up, if it was like, a, say, a poodle getting cut or something like that. If you, if you exclude arrival and return to pick up, and if you just look at that as one, do they still exceed the six? They were, that's what I'm, I think that's where we're, we're, we're trying to get to, and I may not have done a good job of explaining it, but I'm trying to see what the violations, because that's what we're focused on. Right, right. And, and, and help us get there to validate the complaint or not validate it. Um, there were a couple of days that I think uh, Mr. Hargis included in there yes. that, again, I, I tried to take photographs to show the customers with the dogs, it appeared to me, again, I wasn't, I stopped counting customers. Yeah. Does that make sense? I was just photographing them at that point. Um, that it was hard to match up sometimes. Who's, was this a pickup? Was this a drop off? But was it an employee, somebody inside? Was it somebody the employees working were easy. on construction or something? Okay. The, em I the employees were easy to that. say, yeah. uh, or were easy to distinguish. And the construction workers, for the most part, I mean, if someone was there for a longer time, I was, that, that was probably construction if it wasn't an employee. I don't know if I'm answering it, but to my knowledge, there were a few days, yes, when she exceeded six dogs. Or, okay. sorry, I don't know that they were there for dog grooming. They might have been there picking up a dog for her other, for the breeding. Okay. No, no, okay, no. I'm Thank you. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm that... just trying to get it in my own mind, obviously, and and I, I would hate to be where you're located. I'll be the you. first to admit that. But our standard that we have to go with today is a little bit 
whether we like it or we don't like it. And, and that's, what I'm, that's what I'm troubled with right now, if, if you want to know the truth of the matter. So, right. And I thank you because you're exactly the type of neighbor I wish I had in my neighborhood because, you know, neighborhood watch doesn't exist except for people like yourself and your neighbors here that are, that are located and taking your time. So thank you for your, I'm sure Mr. Barkley doesn't appreciate it, but, but some of us do. Thank you. Did, did you have anything else to add? I'm sorry. Um, not really. Just I, I tried my best to show you what I was seeing. Okay. No, thank you. Is there any other questions? All right, thank you. There are three minutes and 55 seconds for the opposition. Are there other, anyone else that wanted to speak? Yes, sir. Is it on now? Yes, sir. It, yes, sir, it's on. My name is Scott Barrow. I live at 412 Bramblewood, which is across the street directly across the street. That driveway there uh, is the driveway that people use as a turnaround, right there. Now this picture here is very old. It, doesn't mess, it does not reflect at all the condition of the neighborhood right now. I noticed that a picture flashed up a minute ago showing the house as it stands now with the addition. So this is what's happened. If this is a home occupancy business, what the heck is that huge building that they've added there? What is that? I think by definition, it's not even going to be a home occupancy business. It's going to be a freestanding business that's going to continue on in perpetuity after the uh, two-year uh, waiver is done and everything else. And that's my main concern, that the precedent this is holding. But again, I have a big picture window that, struts, that faces right out on the room, and I've seen numerous cars coming and going and people taking their dogs and animals to the front door or coming to the thing. Now that, I would see it and I would go, huh. And she had sent us a letter saying, because of the pandemic, she was having to move her business, her dog grooming, dog grooming business to her home and there would be a little construction. Well, I don't consider that a little construction, but I would see, you know, coming and going and everything, but I never thought, well, huh, you know, because I didn't know anything about home occupancy permits or anything like that, but there was constant traffic coming and going. Now they could, obviously what they've done is they've cut this courier thing going now, so no longer are people pulling up, dropping their animals off and leaving and coming and getting them because now they've got the courier service. So there's not that many cars anymore parked in front of the house. But anyway, so I just, I, I would attest to uh, what, uh, the lady before me said, uh, I can document that I, I will agree that, that it's a fair representation of what's been going on. Stephanie's a great lady. Her dad's a great lady. I love him to death. And uh, I'm sorry that uh, this is happening. But uh, like, again, uh, you know, I could probably deal with it. I'm a pretty tolerant person. But uh, I'm just concerned about the precedent and what's going to happen in the future. Even though that's not what we're talking about right now, we'll probably have to revisit it at some point in time. Funny thing, though, today when I was getting ready to go, I looked out my back window of where I live, and four of her dogs are running around in the backyard. So, you know, that's probably just one of those things. She's probably leaving, and they got out. They're cute little dogs. They're the ones that she uses to breed, uh, as it, well, which, again, is a dog breeding business there, too, obviously as well as the courier and the grooming. But anyway, I, f I feel sorry for the people that live right next to her because that huge building goes right up against their uh, house. I mean, I don't, I don't understand. It looks to me like it violates several building codes. But uh, again, that's for another day. Thank you. All right, any, any questions? All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman, for the record, one point of clarification. Uh, the Coast Department does not believe uh, in, in any way that the addition Ms. Foster took out is a legal addition and it's not part of the home occupation. We've, we've actually been through this. Um, and again, I, I just want to remind the board members, my revocation had nothing to do with the number of employ uh, customer visits. Uh, I know it's been talked, it was merely on the fact of the employees. So to be fair to Ms. Foster, 
uh, Coast Department issued the permit for the addition, it does comply with all applicable zoning and building code laws. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think I I think I started that line and and hopefully corrected that. But I I, I appreciate that. And then um, it, I think there's 26 seconds. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in opposition? Uh, seeing none, then we will call back the appellant for a rebuttal. And again, uh, if, if the council lady wants to speak at any time, just raise your hand. First, I do want to clarify something I misspoke on. Um, Emily Duke has not moved in yet. The proper permits uh, sign off on all the construction has not occurred, but she is moving in the premises. I was under the impression she had moved in, but there was a delay in inspections and whatnot. So the first was not met, but she is moving into the premises. Um, I would point out that there, it sounds like the whole neighborhood is against my client. There are two letters that were submitted that were positive to my client that are in the record and would uh, refer those to your uh, consideration. Um, the, we seem to get, uh, the, the board in the last section seemed to get a little afield on some of these other issues where complaints have been made. However, I would also submit to the board that those have all been inspected by the codes personnel and have been established that my clients were at all times mm -hmm. in complete compliance. And as I think Mr. Hargis would acknowledge, he's been given records all the way back to the first days Ms. Foster operated under the permit. She has done nothing but other than try to comply with the law as written. Uh, and this also goes to the fact of using the courier service. She's tried to comply with the law as written and by using couriers who clock in and clock out and they are able to keep who they're working for separately. Um, we would submit this is a legal question. Is this a, a legally authorized way of doing the business? Uh, if it is not, then if the board determines that this is in fact a violation, I would point out, according to statute, there's supposed to be two violations in, that are reported and verified. This is a means of operating business that appears to be legal on all fronts, and this is, would have been the first notification to my clients that that is not appropriate under this section. If the board does in fact believe that this was a violation, we would submit it is not appropriate for a revocation. The language the ordinance adopted was not mandatory. If there's a violation, you must revoke this permit. It is permissive. It says you may revoke this permit. And we would submit that if that is the board's finding, that this is correct, that this process should not be used, then this process will not be used. If this had been accompanied with a discussion with the board prior to, uh, with the, the, the code's administrator prior to a revocation occurred, occurring, we probably could have addressed that with code's administration, that this was an issue and not allowed. The problem is, under this process, a revocation was issued for this alleged violation, and there was no alternative left other than to come to this board in an appeal, because the revocation had, in fact, occurred. This is the kind of thing that I would have thought would have been worked out previously through discussions with the zoning and codes department, but unfortunately was not, because the process didn't allow it. It, it was immediate and mandatory revocation. And I would point out that on each of the violations that have been issued, even these violations which have, by Mr. Hargis's acknowledgement, were not substantiated, there was also revocations issued for each of them. There has been a, a repeated attempt to revoke this permit. And we would submit that it's, I'm not certain why that's the case, because this is something that could have been worked out. The client has shown her intent by everything she has done to comply with the statute, with the ordinance which was passed by our council and to comply with the rules that are in place. 
It's not a case of bending the rules, breaking the rules, trying to push the envelope. It's an attempt to comply with the rules as they exist. And we would submit that the proof that has been shown, the legal proof is, I would submit that she's acted in an entirely legally and acceptable manner. Uh, may be messy, may not be the, mo the way I would have advised going into this on the front end. There are complications and they obviously have to deal with those. But if this is determined to not be appropriate, the remedy in this case of revocation is, not, is also not appropriate. Correct the problem, continue to operate the business, because this, this ordinance was passed by the Metro Council for the sole purpose of addressing people who are impacted just like Ms. Foster. And the Mr. fact Bartley, that they can... I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can I ask you a question? Certainly. You, um, oh, that's right. You didn't get, get your ask your question. I'm sorry about that. Um, so I definitely agree with you that the Metro Council passed this law in response to the pandemic and to allow people to work from home and to operate businesses from their home. But I also think from the passing of the law, they also wanted to manage that because they realized that this might happen in residential areas and they wanted to protect the quiet nature of residentials and the peace and quiet that people enjoy by living in their homes. I understand, it seems to me that you've made a delineation because these were two separate LLCs, that's why she sort of operated within the spirit of the law. But isn't that sort of like a very, like a delineation that doesn't matter because of apparent authority? Because she's a co-owner in both the businesses, because they operated at a same location sometimes at the same time, apparent authority would suggest to the employees and to the average person that this is the same business. And they sort of, and they're also both in the pet business. Now I realize some are drop-offs, some are grooming. That's not the same, but it's sort of all in the same world. That's also she could apparently open another LLC that only dresses dogs. And if she opened another one, and if she was only a minority stake ship and they only dress dogs, then technically maybe it wouldn't apply. I don't think the Metro Council, when they passed this law, was hoping that people would find these sort of hyper technicalities that sort of evaded the spirit of the law. And I think even legally, a parent authority would suggest if it's common ownership taking place at the same location and it's sort of similar businesses, it does give rise that this is one business that maybe does not meet the sort of spirit of the law. So I'm just wondering what you have to say about a parent authority. I understand that they were two separate LLCs, but there is a common owner. There's a similar sort of arena, business arena, and they shared employees. And so I, from an employee, employer relation kind of thing, it looks like a parent authority to me. So I just wondered what you thought about that. Well, a parent authority, in my experience, always rises in a question, if you're dealing with this person and you're entering into a contract, an agreement, who are, are were, were they held out as representing one entity or the other? That's not the case here. In this case, every time there was a courier, they weren't held out as being Hungry Paws. They were held out as being Butler Bailey's. Uh, Hungry Paws doesn't do courier service, so there's not that confusion. It's not an attempt to have a pair. I, I, could, I understand the circumstance that somebody was trying to enter into contracts. Somebody called up and said, uh, I want to... Uh, have the building painted <laughs> who who was who was contracting but that's not that's well, not. I mean I understand that but I just mean from like a neighborhood perspective if I'm a neighbor and I look it up on the the Secretary of State's <laughs> website and she's a co-owner in both businesses mm -hmm. and all of this activity is happening at the same location from a I think to one of the neighbors earlier points it, from my perspective of the evidence I think the neighbors made a good faith effort because she is their neighbor, not to like overstate what they were seeing. But I think because she is the co-owner and there's common ownership and these businesses are kind of related, they're not the same, but they're related, they're all in the pet care field, that it's hard for someone to say which, how many visits is this and which employees working for who, because technically she is their boss because she's an owner in both businesses. And I think that's sort of, at least from my perspective in looking at this, that's sort of a mental hurdle that's hard for me to come over because it just seems like a very hyper-technical thing that sort of evades the spirit of the law. Because like I said, what's to stop her from having another LLC that she's a minority owner and then doing the same thing out of her home? So that's all I have. Well, I would, I would suggest that going through this process and having to incur the expense she's had to incur to get to this point would uh, keep her from trying to do some other kind of LLC uh, and certainly she would, that would be my advice if she was uh, it, requesting it from me. But 
is it, it, it is technical and it is legal, it's because the, the ordinance is technical and legal. You can have one business operating at the address. You can have a limited number of employees of that business working at the property. The distinction I would make is somebody acting as a courier is not working at the property. They've delivered a pet or they've taken a pet, they picked up a pet and taken it away. That is not working at the property. I certainly isn't, I don't think within the spirit of the law, working at the property. Working at the property using a common uh, definition would be working at the property. They're there doing the work of, the, of Hungry Paws, which is grooming pets. As we said, the folks that work for Butler Bailey's are not groomers. They are not groomers. So they cannot do grooming. They're not hired, they're not certified like these ladies are uh, by the state of Tennessee to be groomers. So that is not the kind of services they are providing. So the, it is a very distinct, and though it can become muddied, uh, and it would have been cleaner if there was not some overlapping, somebody moonlighting for Butler Bailey's when they actually also work for Hungry Paws uh, or vice versa would have been cleaner. But the, the reality is that is the process that was set up. They are separate companies operating from separate locations and they, there has not been any proof other than the conclusion of Mr. Hargis that if they're working for Butler Bailey's, they're, they're employees of Hungry Paws, that that ever actually occurred because it didn't. And that wasn't how they were paid. It wasn't how they were turned into the IRS. And it is not it is a distinction, a, a maybe paper thin, but it is a distinction. So uh, I, a quick question. I'm sorry, Tom, did you have a question? Well, I was just going to, and, and one of the advantages of looking out this way is we get to see the people out here. And what we haven't had is today, we've, we've got someone who knows what the legislative feeling and history is. Now, I might have just stepped into a place. Yeah, I, well, I may have just stepped into that particular area that you may not want me to put you, but. I, I, I was planning to address it and I will speak when. When, when okay, then I will reserve my points to that. Okay, my, my question is, um, it, it sounds like what you all have, through the materials that you've submitted or what you stated today is that Hungry Paws does have more than two employees, right? That, that there are checks written on payroll to more than two folks. There's the two groomers and then there's the admin person, there's the other admin person and then there's the bookkeeper and I don't know, or the, the mom who, who may or may not get a check. That may, may not be, but there's at least four folks, right? There's the two folks four that- Four people potentially getting checks. Four people getting checks and the only reason that they that you're saying is that they are not in violation by having too many employees on site is that when all four of them are together, if all four of them are ever together, two are working for one company and two are working for another. Correct. And so, but if I happen to bring in a dog and ask an admin question, I might be doing business for Hungry Paws even though I'm getting paid by the, the courier service. I, and I, I would assume they'd ask the owner. Yeah, no, that doesn't occur. So if, if, I'm, if I'm, I'm, I'm not mentioning, I'll never mention any of my administrative business, not once, not even thinking it or anything if I'm delivering a dog. No, that, that would be handled on the phone remotely. But if I'm sitting there in person with you and I, I wanted to ask you that question, I've, I've never, not once ever done it. Not about, you're talking about, it, are they asking me? I'm just saying there's, I'm saying it's, a, it's, we're talking about this gray area between who works for who. And, and, we're, and, and the, the argument that you all are making, the, 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 the sole argument I think that the zoning administrator is wrong is that when these four people are together, no more than, and I think two is the most you can have working for a company, is that correct? One, one outside employee. One outside, outside. so that's, that's um, so if, if there are two folks working that are, out, one's an outside employee, these other two technically work for the courier service. 
but they also work for Hungry Paws. And I'm just saying, when they are delivering a dog or doing their courier work, how do you, how do you separate in that situation that they not ever mention Hungry Paws business? Well, I, I and, and and does it matter if they're? And I'm asking, and maybe this is a, a legal question for the lawyer question, but and 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 if they're doing Hungry Paws business, but they're on the courier's clock, who are they really working for? Well, that, that, what I'm saying is, you got the two groomers that work for Hungry Paws. You got the other person that works for Hungry Paws part time, some sometime at their home, wherever it is off site, that what y'all testified to. Right. But that other person, when that other person's working for um, Bailey, I, you know, I can't remember Butler Bailey. They deliver a dog to Hungry Paws, but they're on the Butler Bailey clock. But they're also doing their admin work for Hungry Paws. And so I show up, I bring you a dog, and I say, oh yeah, by the way, tell me about that. I need to ask you a question about the admin work. At that point, I've got three employees for Hungry Paws, even though, I mean, I, I, that's, that's where I think that Ms. Davis is getting to some of the, the gray area, because it, it's, um, you know, it's the testimony that, that they never do. There's a system in place to keep it completely separate and no one has ever in their whole life since you've been open mentioned their administrative work when they were delivering a dog. There, certainly, I think there's no indication in the record that it's occurred. No, and uh, they, and I, just... I guess theoretically, if it, things could happen and you can propose a question theoretically, but we're here to respond to what has been accused and what is in the record and what the proof shows. And there is no proof of that. Any other any other questions? And you've got 24 seconds to wrap it up. And and I guess well, I'll ask one last question because after a really long case like this, my you know my head's spinning. I think everybody else is probably too. Um, could you just kind of give me the the elevator the elevator paragraph of why the zoning administrator erred? The the zoning administrator erred because he stated in his opinion his written opinion, and that's what we are here responding to today, that people who are employees of Butler Bailey's when they're delivering pets to the premises are employees of Hungry Paws. That is categorically wrong. It is unsupported in the record. The, the, all of the testimony through affidavits and otherwise that's been placed in the record are that these people work independently. They keep track through clocking in independently. The books are kept separately. The taxes cover Butler Bailey employees and are filed accordingly to comply with the requirements of the United States government and the state of Tennessee for all employment taxes. The insurance is all maintained in the appropriate name based on what they are doing with separate companies and separate insurance. It is people wear two hats, but they keep track to make sure that they're under the right hat when the duties that they are providing occur. There is no proof in the record to substantiate that those people are acting as employees of Hungry Paws when they are delivering pets to this premises. None. Okay. Any, any other questions? Just so, just so I have it clear in my head, who, which of the employees do you say, are you saying lives at the residence? Currently just Ms. Foster. Um, then, Emily is in, is planning to move in on the okay. first. Okay. And, and I understand Ben may too. They are a, okay. a couple. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, sorry. We keep, we keep looking at you and, and, trying to put you on the spot and we just I, I hope it's no not perceived as anything more than an invitation that you can take or not take but I see you're here ready to speak so if you would just yes, introduce yourself and and uh, tell us your th and I think you have to hit the little button turn the yeah. mic right that's Perfect. right uh, I'm Courtney Johnston I am the um, council member for district 26 um, and I have been 
hearing about this particular business for almost a year now from multiple people, phone calls, emails, reaching out over social media saying, what is going on? Just the tremendous amount of traffic and activity. Um, you can drive by it pretty much at any time and see, um, I mean, it, it will make you turn your head as you're driving through what is typically a very quiet um, and, and peaceful neighborhood. Um, I'm going to speak to the purpose of the ordinance. First of all, the ordinance was introduced in 2019 before we even knew what COVID was. The purpose of the ordinance was to allow very small businesses to be able to see a certain number of customers, um, but it was very specific in limiting traffic. We did not want to, by allowing an expanded use of business from a residential property, we did not want it to have a negative impact on the neighbors. So we limited customer visits, uh, we limited hours, um, we limited numbers of employees. Uh, in my estimation and in my observation from my own personal experience with Ms. Foster, I've had her, um, she has groomed my dog, actually. Um, that there has been multiple attempts to evade certain restrictions of the ordinance. Um, the first one being, you know, we've got employees now that are going to be moving into the property. So all of a sudden, well, it's only one employee that doesn't live at the property. We can have up to five employees. So that's just an expanse of, of having this business um, activity. Um, the other is, you know, here's customer visits. Well, what's the customer? Is the customer the dog? Is the customer the owner? Um, and so, you know, how are we dealing with that amount of traffic? Well, so now we're going to get a courier service so that that takes that completely out of it because we've got a courier that can come a hundred times a day, as Mr. Hargis said, because the, he's, you know, he or she is an employee. Um, in my opinion, and I'm so glad that you brought up apparent authority, in my opinion, whether it's a courier, um, whether it's an employee of the grooming company, whether it's a completely, totally separate company that's not um, being paid for or, or owned by Ms. Foster or her parents, the apparent authority is that that person is working at the direction of Ms. Foster. I don't care the name of the company. I don't care who owns the company. In my opinion, they are working at the direction of Ms. Foster. It is a service in support of the, un the main business there, which is grooming, and it all adds to the activity. So the ordinance was for very small businesses. Fortunately for Ms. Foster, she has a very very popular business and, and a very good business, and that's great for her. It is outside the scope of what this ordinance, the purpose of this ordinance was. It is outside the scope of this, of a neighborhood setting. It's much more appropriate to be held in a commercially zoned property. I understand she has a non-compete. In my opinion, her personal situation should not be the reason to disrupt an entire area of the neighborhood because this is the only place that she can operate. It's unfortunate, but it can't disrupt the entire neighborhood just because that's what her personal situation is. Um, I have all of these notes here, um, and I, I don't want to, I, I know we've been talking about this for a long time, and there's cases behind us. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, um, Answer any questions. Um, I'm trying to look through to make sure I'm hitting my points. Um, I, my personal experience with it was I heard about it. Um, I, again, I do have a dog, and um, I used her, and the, she did not know who I was at the at the beginning. And so she mentioned, you know, I'm so sorry that you know if you haven't come to the back door of the house, you know, I'm going to be building an addition to move the business, so you'll be able to come to a separate entrance. So that was that purpose, or it was. It may have changed. Um, and uh, she, she did not have a permit at the time. So when I came back a second time, um, I had already started to receive calls, complaints, you know, and everything. And so I mentioned to her, I am the council member, reminded her she needed to get a permit. She said she was in the process of it. Um, and I went through the rules of the ordinance because I had had, you know, people complaining about number of, you know, people coming in and out of there. She knew all of that. Um, and so, 
it, after that, I decided I, you know, I couldn't support her business anymore just because it was such a dis disruption. But that's my personal experience um, with this particular business. Um, oh, back to evading some things. So when we talk about um, where Butler's Bailey, Butler, the, you know what I'm talking about, I don't know, <laughs> um, where it's registered, that was just changed to her parents' address in January, um, according to the, the website. So yes, it's not registered at that address at 415 Bramblewood, but it is operating out of there. So again, just lots of different things in order to evade what the ordinance restrictions were and the ordinance restrictions were to limit the impact on the neighborhood, which has literally been unbelievable. It, I mean, I just, you can't imagine the number of phone calls and questions and um, things. And so I hate having to be here because Ms. Foster is a constituent of mine. Um, but I feel it, it's my responsibility to speak up for the people whose quality of life is being impacted. Questions? So at the end of it, I would say, please, I would, um, it, it's my strong desire that this revocation be upheld. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. With that, we will close the public hearing. Mr. Chairman, would it be possible, and now I'm looking at our legal counsel, not Joey, but you, um, and I just had a very simple question so that I don't go off the rails. What exactly is the scope of review that we're into right now, whether it's limited, unlimited, how far can we go, and what is the issue specifically? Can you... And I'm sorry, I did not mean to put you behind the rock like that. <laughs> the, the, yeah, I, you have a tendency to do that, right? <laughs> it's like you've already done that. It's like, no. It's a, smart it's, so the issue, you would just be limited to the scope of whether or not the zoning administrator erred in the zoning administrator's decision. So it is, I mean, I think you're identifying that it's that very narrow issue, but that's what the board would have to look at. So I, and, so, oh, but, uh, question, if we do determine that the zoning administrator did not err, do we have an option to reduce the revocation period? Uh, that's not something that's considered under the ordinance. We, we well, um, yeah, it may not be under the ordinance, but do we lack that power? I mean, we, we, yeah, I mean, we do that with, we, 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 we did that with short-term rental permits. I would note that with the short-term rental ordinance, that is specifically contemplated under right. any number of the iterations of the ordinance, but the absence of that here seems to raise a question as to whether or not that really is within the scope of what's available in your review. Again, separate ordinance, similar section of law, but separate ordinance that I don't know gets there. I'll be happy to do a little more reading while you deliberate, though. And, and John, before you... De deliberate. I'll ask you or and or uh, you and and uh, Joey. Just the standard question I usually ask it in item A case is that we've heard a lot of testimony and oftentimes when our cases happen, you know, new information's come up, up about. We've had uh, the case packet that was presented, which was uh, thicker and more substantial than the case packet I saw when we reviewed cases for the consent agenda a week ago, and. Is there anything that you've heard today from, you know, any of the testimony that would uh, have you reconsider your original uh, determination that the permit should be revoked? Mr. Chairman, after looking at this, there is not, and I understand um, Mr. Bartley's position that structurally, legally, that these are two separate entities and these employees, although working for both, are, are not here. I'm looking at the ordinance as the council wrote it, and it says that there may not be more than one employee not residing in the home. As I stated at the beginning, I believe even though they may be separate entities, Ms. Foster owns them both. So it would be, in my mind, I've tried to work through in my head, Ms. Foster turning to Ms. Foster saying, 
you know, like, you know, the customers are hiring these couriers to bring the dog to my service. Those couriers are employees of Miss Foster's. Under that LLC, their employees, her groomers are employees of Miss Foster's there. Anytime those two entities, even if they're separate, Miss Foster is the, the owner, and I've stated in my revocation, even partial owner. When there's two of those people present on the premises, that's a violation. Okay. And, and, so I, and I, I usually ask, because there, there have been, very, very rarely, there's cases where information is presented that wasn't known to the <laughs> zoning staff uh, ahead of time that does change the mind, and I always just yes, make sure that, that after however long we've been here, we're, we're back to where we started, which is you've made your case, they sure. made yours case, and everybody's still confident in their, in their cases. And, and there was a lot of discussion about customers coming on the premises. I, I have no, in no way in my revocation letter like that. The number of violations that I saw listed in my um, in March. Three times this uh, business had one too many employees on premises. That's what it boils. That's what's in the record, and that's what I understand. This all boils down to. Yes, sir. And and I, and in the photos I submitted to count to opposing counsel, uh, noting you know one photograph in particular uh, that showed that uh, showed Mr. Mears and I, I apologize, sir. I, I keep forgetting your last name. The, the the courier for the they're both literally in the photograph together. Um, you know, the, and, and I think the date was December eighth, but. Those two instances are two verified complaints that the ordinance calls for, um, and, and that upon which you know I made that revocation uh, and did, as, as counsel testified, reinstated it, revoked it again, reinstated it a second time to provide more time. So there is that back and forth that did occur. I don't, don't deny that. Um, I would change the process of, of how I did it initially, but it, to me, at the end result, there's still a violation here, um, whether they're two companies, three companies, they're all employees of Ms. Foster's, um, and they're at the place more than they can't be there um, at the same time. Any other questions for the zoning staff at this point? Ms. Davis? I didn't have a question. Okay. Uh, my, uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I've listened to all the evidence. And what Mr. Hargis just said is how I've looked at this case the entire time. Like, forget all the ancillary stuff. If you boil this down to what it is, the same person had more than the requisite amount of employees at the same property. And so I think that is in the record, and that's undisputed. Um, her counsel did a really good job of pointing to other things on the record, but I think the inconsistencies in the affidavit that Mr. Pepper pointed out earlier and then the undisputed fact that she is a owner of both businesses who has employees and they were at the same location means that the permit should be revoked. And now if you look at the ancillary evidence outside of that issue between all of the neighbor complaints, the testimony of counsel, I think it contravenes the spirit of the law. Neighborhoods are meant to sort of be a place of peace and quiet residential enjoyment. They permitted this exception to allow people to sort of operate micro businesses. I think by having multiple LLCs sort of be affiliated, not necessarily run, but affiliated with the same address has obviously disrupted the quiet enjoyment of this neighborhood just based off of the testimony we've heard. So I'm squarely okay with upholding the revocation and finding <laughs> that the zoning administrator did not err in his determination. I do feel bad for the applicant, but I think that there's not really a remedy here for us to give her. If I can ask staff one quick question, it, I don't ever remember in my very short tenure on this, a case like this under this particular ordinance. And, and David, you've been here a whole lot longer than I have, clearly. Yeah, no, uh, I don't, I don't So remember. this is a case of first impression, which will sort of guide us in the future, I'm assuming. And I'm now looking at John Michael. Guide us is the key term there, no. Each case is treated as an individual case. No true precedent is set as we have to treat every piece of property, every permit issued or not issued as an individual case with individual analysis. Yes, this is our first 
I think it's fair to say for a substantial case before the Board of Zoning Appeals with regard to the more newly adopted home occupation permit ordinance. I believe uh, Council Member Johnston kind of gave you the correct timeline to give you a sense of just how recent this was. However, uh, Mr. Hargis and I, as uh, codes employees and Metro employees of many years, can assure you there have been lots and lots of attempts to rework this notion of a home occupation permit through the years, but it's always been a very divisive thing where folks couldn't quite bridge the gap between the balance of neighborhood protection and small-scale commercial opportunities within residences. Because we now have this more fleshed out ordinance, I think that it's entirely probable that we'll see a few more of these cases if there are in fact violations or problems with regard to uh, renewing or otherwise keeping up permits under the terms outlined by the ordinance. But I do not regard this decision as being one that is directly restrictive on what a board could decide at a later date on a different case. I hope that last sentence in particular is pretty directly responsive to your question. It was, and, and we were fortunate enough this time to have at least the legislative intent and background to it, which probably swayed me from one side to the other this time. So anyway, thank you. Any, any other comments? So I, I, would, I don't like the ordinance. I don't think we, I, I don't like the idea of having pet grooming businesses in a residential neighborhood because I think it's going to create disruption. Um, but that's not, that's not my role here today. And I, I empathize with the neighbors because I don't, I don't like the idea of that. But, I, you know, what I see here is you've got a one-year revocation of somebody's right to, to, to operate a business from their home when on three, only three occasions, they had one too many employees at the place. And, and, and that would not, that's, that did, if you take that away, the, the neighbors are still gonna have the same issue with people coming and going. That's just gonna happen with a business. And again, I empathize with them. I also think it is a very, and I think now with the advice of counsel that um, uh, Ms. Foster would, would do things differently, but I think that we wouldn't be here if instead of using a courier service that had mutual employees and mutual ownership, she had just used some other courier service. And, and there would have been the same amount of traffic in the neighborhood. And, and I do think it's a close call as to whether there's, there's a violation. I think it was fraught with peril to, you know, have employees working for do, two different companies on site and, and doing different duties. Um, I think that we, I think the, the one-year revocation period, given that this is a legal business that has been approved by the Metro Council, I think, I think one year for having three times having one too many employees on the premises is just draconian. I think it's too much. And I think that if we have the ability to reduce that, then um, we should definitely do that. And I, and I think we do. Um, I think that if we, I think that the legal, the, the zoning administrator's decision is legally correct in, in terms of the analysis of this, but as Mr. Bartley pointed out, if, if we don't have the, the opportunity to reduce that one year penalty, then, you know, I would be inclined to find that maybe the administrator erred by revoking this permit with these minor violations, knowing there'd be a one year essentially uh, period. Again, I, I'm, I, I'm really troubled with that because I think that the, the zoning administrator's analysis of this legally was, was spot on. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm inclined unless, you know, council tells us that there is some clear law that says we cannot reduce the one year period, then, you know, I'm inclined to, I believe their, their the zoning administrator did not err, but I think the, the one year revocation for this very minor violation is too much. Uh, Ross, I had a question. You, you say the three, it happened three times and I, where did you get three times? Because when I look at, when I look at the documents that the appellant provided, there are 22 times that the Bailey, that the courier service delivered a dog in just in March. Okay. And, well, I, I, I know the records you're talking about, but I think I confer with Mr. Argus that, that it was just three times that they determined that 
that either, I can't remember the names of the two employees, that they were on site, I think it was two days in December. It's in, it's in Mr. Hargis's letter of, um, it's in his letter of March 17th. Employee logs indicates two employees present at the same time on December 7th, 8th, and 17th. And I think I just confirmed that with Mr. Hargis. So, um, and again, I go, I think too, if, if this, if this, Ms. Foster would have just used a separate independent company, I mean, they could have had four or five people on site. So, am, am I hearing a plea to the smart legal minds over there that we may or may not have equity jurisdiction in part, or is it a mandatory statute? or excuse me, ordinance. Find us some equity. Um, occasionally noted in court during a previous life that it's the Metropolitan Code of Laws, not the Metropolitan Code of Fair. Um, so I'm sorry that I don't have an easy path to equity for you there. There are three sections of law here within the Metro Zoning Code that I would point to kind of in response to Mr. Pepper's line of questions about the authority of the board to shape the decision that it eventually reaches. First is the ordinance itself under 1716, what, 250D, I believe, home occupation, which talks about the Board of Zoning Appeals hearing appeals of revocations, if in fact such revocations are given, does not specify whether or not there is the ability to alter the one year. There's no language that says you can. To Mr. Pepper's very direct question, there's no language that says you can't. Uh, looking then into the powers of the board, found under 17.40.180, no specific language saying that you can nor that you cannot alter certain conditions of the uh, eventual effect of an approval or denial of an item A case. The thing that I thought might come closest was under 17.40.270, and I'm sorry to bore you with the citations, but just in the event that a transcribed record of this case is in fact needed for folks that make more money than we do to make such decisions, I wanted to be able to cite to those three sections. 270 is the part that talks about the board's ability to use conditions, but that section talks specifically about variances, special exceptions, hillside exceptions, which you virtually never hear, and what we call item D cases, cases involving legally non-conforming uses, structures, or lots. So referring back to 180, that's the items B, C, or D. Very pointedly, item A cases, like the one before you today, are not included under 174270. Therefore, the board does not have an express authority to apply conditions to their decision on a case uh, or an approval, as the case may be. So no. does the board say no, you, does the law say no, you can't? does not appear to say it expressly in the zoning code. Does anything say you can? Absolutely not. Um, if that feels non-responsive, as it may for some who are not lawyers, I, I apologize for that, but I suspect the three lawyers well, on the board so will interpret I, that the way they're inclined to interpret that. So what, it, so I'm, what you're saying is you're not sure. I mean, is that fair to say? I'm sure what the law says, and I'm sure there's nothing in there that says that you can place conditions or otherwise modify specific terms of the ordinance. Okay. Um, so, and, and if we did, then certainly any, either either party could appeal that. That's exactly that right. Can be in decided fact, by a, whether you a did or not, than, than us here, I guess. That's right. Okay. Whether you uh, altered the one-year provision in a final order or not, either party could appeal based upon any any desire to take it to chancery and see if a different outcome is one that they can achieve. Ms. Davis? Uh, I was going to say thank you, Mr. Michael, for that explanation, because while I definitely understand and appreciate Mr. Pepper's rationale, I'm not necessarily feeling inclined to cut the one year. I understand the evidence that he's pointing to, but I think just from, a, from my thinking of it, if the same person has, is a common owner in two LLCs and a related business, the likelihood of more than the requisite amount of employees showing up at the location is more likely than not because she's the co-owner in both businesses and they kind of share employees. And so from my perspective, yes, Mr. Hargis only relied on three instances, but we don't, we're putting the onerous on the code staff and the neighbors to catch her every time. And I just don't think that's fair. I think if you own two LLCs, that employ people and they have some relation to the home, it's, it, at, from my perspective, the revocation stance. But I do understand Mr. Pepper's point, which I think is a good one, that if she had just used an independent courier, then maybe that wouldn't have happened. And I do think that that's a good point to make. So I'm sort of, I mean, 
I can make a motion, but I don't know if it has any support. Uh, but um, I, I'm, I move that uh, we uphold the revocation for one year and that the zoning administrator did not err based off of the evidence that he um, relied on to make that decision. Would you accept an amendment to that, that we uphold the decision of the zoning administrator, but we reduce the one-year period? How much of a reduction? It was revoked in, uh, let's see, the one year begins running on April 29th. That's when it was revoked for the uh, first time. So I would say uh, reduce it so that the, uh, the, uh, the uh, applicant can reapply in June 1st. Of this year? Of this year. And, and I'm open to, to discussing that. Okay, can we? Just, board, I, so I just, I think, t I think 12 months, and I, you know, is is too much. I, I think yeah. June 1st is fair, but if other people think that, well, so I, in the spirit of compromise, in the spirit of compromise, like I, 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 I'm, I think if you're, if you want to amend it to like, to reduce the time, I would be open to that. One month feels a little too short to me in light of just all the evidence that we saw, I would probably be more inclined to support maybe a three to six month period, but based off the input of what other people are feeling. So I, I want us to reach a decision. I'm willing to compromise, but I just think one month is too short just based off of everything we saw. So that's just my opinion, but I'm, I'm still listening. Okay, so can we leave, I guess we can leave your motion open until uh, well, this, or do you want to date for well, me? At this point, there's no second. And so, so there's no second. Just, yeah, nobody seconded okay. it. We can just continue to talk. And, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, to me, it's, it's one of those situations where if you, if you believe it, the argument that the zoning administrator is making about the companies and the employees, then, you know, the zoning administrator is upheld. And, I'm, and, I, and I tend to believe that. But I also, I don't have the problem that Ross has with the three. I, I, I mean, and, and because the documentation is that this is a almost everyday thing. And so it wasn't that, you know, it, it's almost like, you know, the, the cop caught you speeding three times, but then you present a log saying you were speeding 22 times a month. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, you're a speeder. I mean, and so if you believe that the, that the employees re really, that is a violation, then the documentation that they provided shows that it was a lot more than three. And so, I, I mean, I'm not saying, and, and so to me, I'm, I'm comfortable not even addressing the penalty, but just saying the zoning administrator was right, because I think that the, 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 testi the testimony was that the penalty was kind of at the discretion. Now, if they want to, if it is the zoning administrator's discretion and they want to take a look at that, then that's, to me, outside of what, what we're considering. Now, if the rest of the board feels strongly that it, it should be more than that, like, you know, you say reduce it, then I'm certainly willing to go down that road, but, but I'm not, I just, I'm not saying that, uh, and again, I, I, get it, I get it that it's unfortunate uh, and, and all that, and I also get that it's a big disruptor, but those really aren't the questions. It's did the zoning administrator interpret this correctly, and uh, if so, then is there additional remedy? Like, so you raised the, the question, do we have an additional remedy uh, point? So I don't mind taking those together. I don't mind taking them separately. I don't want to take them together, you know, take them separately and then have, you know, some feel like that, that the, the penalty part was, you know, a minor to it. So I, let's, I guess we can just keep talking, but, um, I, I, I mean, from what I understood from Mr. Michael's, uh, reading of what the zoning code is and his, uh, perfect citations that he somehow remembers um, as, as very much not a lawyer, uh, and I'll defer to my esteemed colleagues on this, but I mean, it doesn't sound like we have the ability to reduce that time just from what I heard in his citations being read. So, um, I mean, that's, it sounds like it is kind of an all or nothing based on what I've heard. And again, I, I'm not an expert in that, so I'll defer to you guys. <laughs> Well, I, I, will, I will compliment John Michael on his 
whole lot of saying, double talk to get us no answer. I try to do it on my best days and don't accomplish it nearly as well as he did today. Uh, unlike a couple of the other folks here today, I don't have a problem with the multiple LLCs and similar employees. And, and, and that's, that's not a determinative factor. They've got a business that's very unpopular, obviously, because it's disruptive. There are advantages of living in Oak Hill because we don't have those types of situations there, oh, by the way. Um, but I do think the one year without an ability to, to modify it, and if that's what I'm hearing from staff, I can't support it. I think it's a little bit too draconian. Um, do I think they tried to maneuver around the, the intent maybe and the purpose of the ordinance? There's no question in my mind. But the law allows you to do that uh, if, it's, if it's unsure. Hence my questions, is this a case of first impression? Do we have anything to go back to? I've got legislative history sitting out there that told us that wasn't the intent of what they wanted to do. So I guess in a certain respect, I'm, I'm saying the law is a little bit too hard to enforce using the term of Mr. Taylor in the past. I just can't agree to go with something that harsh, especially on our, our zoning or our, our uh, other cases that we've had. So I'm. I'm just sort of leaning that way. If we could find some way to get it less than, one of the sides is going to appeal. And let's give it to the person that wears that black robe is kind of where I'm thinking. Well, and, and that, that may be where it, it goes to, and then that's the question is, and, and, and that may be where, you know, a, a reduction happens or, or a reversal happens. But, um, yeah, so, I, well, I guess it's, I want your name to be first on the complaint. Yeah. Well, Ms. Davis would, would say. Well, a lot of people complain about September me. first be. I'm trying. I'm trying to. I think you've indicated you might consider. Some. I know, but I feel like my motion died, and then Mr. Newton said repeated what Mr. Michael said. So I'm like, well, do we? I guess I. In the spirit of compromise, I'm, that's why I was. I sort of was like, yes, like let's talk about it, just so that we can kind of give them a decision. Um, but do, I mean, if, so from your legal, per, you know, you're under your lawyer, do you think we have the sort of leeway to kind of put that sort of parameter around it where we lessen it? I, I think we do. I mean, nobody's stopping us here. It's you know, somebody, <laughs> somebody, a higher authority may say we did not, but I mean, I'm, I, I think that's unresolved. And I think that if we uphold the administrator's decision, then that would be upheld on appeal. And if a court decides that, you know, it's a one year mandatory, then, you know, it's, it's one year. So I, I, I view it as if it's something we're willing to do, what does it hurt? I mean, if we're reversed, we're reversed, but. Won't be the first time. And, and so I, I see Ms. I want to hear what Ms. Kaufman had to say. Yeah, I've been really quiet because I've been taking a trip down memory lane with David Taylor, probably. And about four or so years ago, we heard our first short-term rental property case, and we all felt that the one-year penalty was very harsh. And it's interesting to hear you all say this today about this type of case. And I'm actually kind of, my heart is beating really fast because that was a really hard time on the board um, seeing these. You know, in those cases, there were some minor infractions and people were getting a year penalty. In this case, maybe the you know infractions are a little bit harsher because the neighborhood seems to be so severely impacted by what's going on at this business. But what I'm hoping will happen if we reduce the penalty um, that the applicant will work very hard to come up with a plan that does not disrupt the neighborhood so much. And I would, we would really, um, I think the council lady too would like to hear some kind of plan that, um, so your business would not be so harmful um, to the neighbors. And I'm sorry if I'm speaking for the councilwoman, but she seems to be very concerned about your neighbors. So that is what I hope would happen here today. 
Well, and I, I don't even know what we are. Well, I, I think I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, it, it sounds like that there's a general consensus that the zoning administrator did not err. There is not consensus on uh, whether it's just a flat vote on did uh, he err and let it be versus did he err and the applicant should be able to reapply at a certain time. Um, you know, and so, I mean, I think that there can be maybe it, if someone wants to make a motion, uh, just a on one one extreme or the other, we can see if if there are four votes one way or the other. Um, in fact, I mean, um, or or they can try to to throw out some time frame compromise. Um, since I, I put myself I mean, out here, I'll go ahead and do it again because you all keep looking at me. Uh, <laughs> I, I, so uh, my motion is uh, that the, we move that the zoning administrator did not err and that based off the evidence, he made the correct decision in revoking the permit and that the applicant can reapply for a new permit in six months. That's my compromise. <laughs> I just cut it in half. So that was, that's how, because I, I see both sides. And I would. April 1st or April whatever it was? Just to clarify. Uh, uh, it was April, April 9th was the revocation date. So okay, six, so from April 9th. So, Thank so you. six months from April 9th or six months from today? Six months from the revocation day. So April 9th. So that really, that'd be like five months from today. I'll second that motion. All right, there's a motion and there's a second um, discussion on the motion. It, 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 I haven't decided how I'm gonna vote, but if I vote against the motion, it's because I think it should be a little longer than six months. But I agree that the zoning administrator did not err. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion, say aye, raise your hand. Those opposed, that motion passes. Uh, the applicant, uh, the zoning administrator did not err and the applicant would be able to reapply although the uh, issuance of the permit is not uh, assumed it is, the applicant is eligible to reapply in six months from the revocation date. Next case. Okay, Mr. Chairman, we'll get back underway. The next case the board will hear is case 2021-67. Mark Wallace is the appellant. Martha Carol Swafford, owner of the property at 13, excuse me, 1235 Dickerson Pike, requesting a special exception to the front setback and a variance and rear setback in CS. Uh, this is in MDHA overlay. Uh, the applicant's constructing a 17-unit townhome development. Refer to the board under section 1716030F. 1716-150, appellant has alleged the board would have jurisdiction to under section 1740-180 items B and C. Um, I see the appellants here. Are there any parties present on K67 in the opposition? Mr. Chairman, I, I see no hand. So, uh, Mr. Walsh, you'll have five minutes to present after I go through the, the slides here. The subject property is located uh, at the intersection of uh, Dickerson Pike uh, and Douglas Avenue. This is a air, little older area uh, of the building that existed on the site previously. That, that building has been demolished. The, uh, I want to clarify the special exception ask here. The applicants are, as you'll see on the site plan, there are some shaded areas along the perimeter, both on Douglas and on Dickerson. Uh, the applicants are dedicating right-of-way 
to the city as a part of this development. Uh, my initial citation uh, along the Dickerson Pike frontage uh, did not take that into account with his setback. So he's actually in compliance on Dickerson Pike. His only uh, area of non-compliance will be along Douglas Avenue. There's a 15-foot setback required in CS, and so that, that 15 feet will start from where my cursor is. So it's, it's really a portion of this building. The longer stretch on Dickerson Pike does comply with the setback provisions. The second variance um, here is along the rear property line, which is the alley. It's the eastern property boundary. Uh, there is a 20-foot setback required there, um, and so he's showing a five-foot setback. So that variance is 15. These numbers at the top, I'll need to adjust those a little bit, and I'll do so uh, during his testimony and give you an accurate number there. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is in an MDHA overlay. We did check with MDHA to see if their uh, Skyline Redevelopment District set forth some setback provisions. It does not. It's silent to that, so it, it falls under the board and under the Coast Department's review. This is looking at the subject property from Dickerson, uh, looking toward across the site toward the alley and Douglas Avenue, and then views looking south in the upper left photograph toward downtown and then north on the side here at Dickerson Pike. This is actually a ground shot of the, of the former building uh, that sat here uh, on, the, on the premises. And then uh, views looking in the upper left down Douglas East on Douglas toward the rear property boundary and then the bottom two shots are uh, views. The bottom left photograph is a view south along the alley and the opposing view north uh, from the opposite end. Uh, this is a special exception case. I, I'm, received evidence from the appellant they did hold a neighborhood meeting as required by the board's rules. And I will uh, amend these numbers on the street setback to reflect the proper distance there. But with that, I'll turn over to the applicant to present his case to the board. All right, if you would uh, turn your mics on, uh, whoever's speaking, and state your name and address. And while you're here, and I know you, you, you did say you had a community meeting, or, or Joey did, so if you tell us about the community meeting uh, I know planning has a recommendation to approve the project, and then if you did have any uh, uh, conversations or work with the council person too, if you would just uh, let us know uh, that feedback as well. Sure. Hi, my name is John Root. I'm the architect for the uh, applicant. Uh, our office address is 753 Alloway Street, and I'm here with... Rick Wells, and my address is 600 uh, Broadway, Unit 1901. Uh, thank you very much. And yes, um, Mr. Hargis uh, correctly stated that we are indeed compliant with the front setback along Dickerson. And I think what you got here, we've, we're trying to uh, propose uh, multifamily residential in a CS zone lot, so that's always a challenge. Um, and as you see, because this is a transit corridor, we get, we're getting squeezed <coughs> on every side of this. So having to dedicate a lot of right-of-way on Dickerson to allow that future sidewalk and, and right-of-way frontage um, and then widen the alley for fire department access. We're taking our, you know, 120, 23 foot wide lot and we're significantly getting less and less and less. And so that's, that's one of our biggest hardships here today is that it's a city imposed hardship of re reducing our width um, and making our lot very tough. The second being it is a corner lot um, and we're trying to wrap the corner with an urban development. So if uh, this was zoned a mixed use property, I think we would be in compliance with most of the setbacks. So um, we did have a community meeting. Um, we presented this to the Cleveland Park Neighborhood Association. I don't think they formally voted, but there was an act uh, active discussion about how that they approved of this uh, type of development here. Uh, they thought it was a very pro neighborhood and pro and uh, smart development, smart growth for their neighborhood. They, they preferred this over the multitude of other uh, uses offered by CS zoning. So uh, that was a very good positive discussion. Um, we've attempted to contact the council member, uh, me not personally, but the owner has, and we have, um, have not gotten much feedback uh, to date. Um, I hope, I'm hoping because that what we're asking for is, is well within the realm of possibility. Um, so um, I think I've covered all my notes. I want to be brief. I know everybody's been, been here a while talking about the last case, so um, I'm here to answer questions or anything you might have. Thank you. So what exactly is the hardship? 
the hardship is we have a narrow lot because we have, we're having to dedicate right away on the alley and on Dickerson Pike. And we're having to dedicate a lot of, um, a lot of property on, on Douglas also. So it is also a corner lot. So we're impacted by a multitude of different setbacks. And, and I think that, that technically the, the Douglas Avenue ask is a special exception. Correct. Which has a different criteria. And the alley ask is a variance. Correct. Which would have the hardship Correct. question. And so the heart, so okay, so that you're saying that that the project got scooted back because you dedicated enough right away to bring the sidewalk up to code Correct. and give Dickerson the on uh, Dickerson. transit corridor. So that's so your alley hardship, and then the other the Douglas side would have the criteria for the special exception. Correct. Mr. Chairman, I don't think I mentioned in the presentation. I believe you've got a letter from planning in support. Uh, yep, plan, okay. planning did, and but the, and the planning recommendation is just for the special exception. But they usually talk about the whole nature of the whole project. Uh, I, w I have another question for the applicant. Um, so I guess my other question would be: Is some of this sort of not with the special exception, but with the variance? Like, is some of this request like? prompted by the design? Like, did you all consider a different design or less units so that you wouldn't have to ask for uh, such a huge, uh, particularly the variance, because that's 15 feet. So did you guys consider like an alternative design or less units so that you wouldn't have to necessarily ask for the variance? Uh, yes, we, we could potentially move those units off of Douglas, but uh, the planning staff would like us to come meet the sidewalk. So that's part of it. Um, is that, can I answer your question? Yeah, okay. So again, we're just trying, we're trying to create a, a urban uh, sidewalk friendly development that meets the sidewalk. And of course with the, the larger impact uh, requirements of CS zoning don't allow us to do that. I guess my, my question, I, I, think, I think this was really Ms. Davis's question is, I think it looks like that of the, uh, 17 units that are here, uh, there's four of them that are in that rear setback, and, and one of them is along Douglas. There's three that are off Douglas. I guess that's, I think that, that was more her question in, especially looking at different plans that might involve less units or, uh, or whatnot. I guess, you know, I, it seems like you, with, with the special exceptions granted, you could build all but four of those units. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. That is correct. And I think too, and thank you, Mr. Newton. So I'm, full disclosure, I'm super familiar with this area. Up until a couple of months ago, I drove down Dickerson Road every day to get home. I live less than a mile from this location. Retrograde Coffee is literally across from Douglas. So hyper familiar with this area, which I don't know if that helps you guys or not. So my question is, like, I understand the Douglas and I understand the special exception. I take less issue with that. I guess my more along those four units that are in the alley that'll be facing the alley. It was sort of like, is that a design choice? Like, did they need those four extra units? Because I think that's where I think the hardship, that it was self-imposed because the special exception just relates to the Douglas and giving that urban footprint. And the pictures don't actually show it, but they're sort of similar units like coming right beside where you guys are on Douglas. So I think that's in line with how that sort of is developing. So that makes sense. But I don't think there's really anything in the alley yet. And if I'm wrong, please correct me. So that's what I guess was that self-imposed by just putting those units there. And so that was kind of my question. I understand that you're saying the CS zoning sort of imposed that requirement, but I think that thank you, Mr. Newton, for trying to flesh out my question. That was it. Those are my comments. They, I okay. think I understood their argument. Like they answered my question. All right. Any other <laughs> <laughs> well, and yeah, and, and looking at, we, there are a lot of developments like this that are being built all over town and, you know, and, you know, I guess, you know, I, you know, I look at it and I think, well, you know, if I were the neighbor across the alley, it's nice to see the face of the house instead of the garage, but then at the same time, it's like, it'd be nice also to, I kind of, you know, if the car's backed into the alley, that might, you know, be not be a bad thing too. Um, I do I do appreciate that it is on an alley, um, but what I guess the were you 
not to have dedicated the right of way, do you would you have still been able to build those three units on the alley? Um, is it the right of way that's causing the hardship ask for those three units that are sitting in the middle of the parking lot? Yes, it absolutely is. If, if we could move closer to Dickerson, those three units would be well out of the rear setback. Yes. Okay. Any other? Well, I, I'm going to bring up my trees again, which forewarned, uh, and they're aren't a whole lot of them, with all due respect. Um, and it's a pretty barren part of town. And while I'm not near as familiar as, well, that part is across yeah, the street. There be a building there that, the, the building well, I understand, but there's nothing there now. And there's going to be a bunch of concrete in the future <laughs> and, and what have you. Um, and a pretty big sidewalk. And, and I like trees. I'm sorry. I just, OK, have you guys looked at since you're asking and if you didn't have those at least three of those units on the alley you could have trees there which is a quality of life issue for for a lot of folks have you thought is there any way to put any other additional trees in any of the design that you used to have now but joey decided not to let me look at my there you go joey keep going bingo um, May I comment on that? Please do. Yeah. Please do. So, uh, part of the right of way dedication is to add the tree canopy down Dickerson. So, the trees that we would have put on the on that rear setback are now going along. Right. I, I, I saw them. You know, you, if they were a little bit closer together. I mean, I was just asking if you had taken that into account, and apparently you have. So, I'll yeah, leave it. Yes, sir. We have. I'll um, leave it. Yeah. Thank you. All the way around the property. Yep. Okay. Yep. And I have one more question, and then I'm done. Um, Mr. Wallace, how much uh, setback did you have to give the city on the front end of Dickerson? Uh, say that again. Sorry, I'm having a No, I said how much, how much right away did you have to dedicate on Dickerson to the city? Uh, I believe it is a total of 15 feet, um, if the survey we have is correct. Okay, thank you. <laughs> And then, what, I'm sorry, tell, what did the council person say? Or what is the council uh, person we, we have not received any feedback from the council person. Okay. And then, you know, there, there are three letters of opposition that are all kind of saying the same thing. And I don't, I don't, I, I don't understand their point based on what you're saying. And because they do say, and, and again, it, a lot of times, you know, you see the red sign and it says front setback variance and you're not sure exactly what, what they're asking for. Um, so and not, no, no offense to the folks riding in, but they all talk about, you know, uh, wanting, you know, walkability and, you know, for the quarter to be, you know, set for man's transit and that type of thing. But it, it seems like what you all are trying to do is bring this up to full code in terms of the sidewalk and, and street plan. So it, it, is there, I don't know, does anybody else have any concerns about the, the three letters we got? Because it, they really do all say the same thing, but from what I can see, it, what you're doing is actually more walkable than what was there. Uh, it has a greater green space. It has a, you know, the, the grass strip between the street and the sidewalk. So, I mean, if, if their concerns are those, it, it feels like, at least on paper to me, that these meet that. And is that... I don't have the privilege of having those letters to understand, to read them, but um, I, I, I agree with you. I think what we're producing here is very much what the planning staff is in support of with the street trees and the walkability and um, all that kind of urban kind of um, in action. Um, so I believe we actually, you know, we, we did the project across the alley on Doug Douglas, and we actually are closer to the road than what we were showing here. So in a way, we, we're, we're kind of meeting what the new development is coming down Douglas also. So all those sidewalks will all tie in together and create a very nice walkable. So you, you said you did do directly across the alley that... Uh, the picture... Uh, oh, where it says ABCD right there? Correct. You, th okay. There's a picture of the, the empty lot. You'll see it in the back. We have some garages facing... There we go. There we go, right there. Okay. We have four single-car garages facing the alley there. Okay. 
Thank you. Any, any other questions for the applicant? Did you have anything else to add? All right, we'll close the public hearing. I was looking forward to hearing about the horses and the courses. I didn't get that today. <laughs> um, I have to save it sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think the fact that the right of way is being dedicated on Dickerson and that limits their um, available uh, building footprint in that way, I think that's really the hardship for the rear setback. I know the other on Douglas is a special exception and like he said, they're improving the pedestrian experience, which is what you need to do with a special exception. Um, so I was at first with the horses and the courses, but now I, I mean, I see the, you know, the city mandated right of way dedication as being the hardship. I, I want you to know that if you make that a motion, I will second it. And that's how I was looking at it at first too. That's why I asked all those questions. But then when I realized it's the same amount of footage, like they're essentially asking us for what they gave up. And so that's why I was like, that's how I got there in my mind. So if you make a motion, I'll second it. Sounds good. <laughs> I will uh, move to approve the special exception request on Douglas Avenue and the rear setback request off the alley due to the hardship of um, the amount of right of way that was dedicated to the city. Can, can that include the, the special succession on Dickerson as well? I think that was yeah. part of it. Yes, it's got both Douglas and Dickerson for special exception. Oh, Joey uh, mentioned that the Dickerson oh. was taken away, right? That was taken away. Okay. Yeah, the, the special exception is only for Douglas now. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, so there's the motion to approve the special exception and variance request. Ms. Davis, is that a second? I second it. Seconded by Ms. Davis. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Any opposed? That motion passes. Good luck. And last case. I got worried there. I saw three people sitting in the audience, and uh, I thought maybe I missed a case. But uh, the uh, final case before us, case 2021-68, uh, Kevin Glenn and Tracy Glenn are the owners and appellants of the property at 241 Graham Drive, requesting a variance in side setback and maximum allowable square footage. Uh, in the RS10 district to construct a garage referred to the board under section 17. Uh, didn't write that section down. It's, uh, I'll get it for you, 17, 12. Seventeen twelve oh fifty is the section of code in which this comes to before you. I will go through the photographs now. The subject property is located here in red. It's in an RS10 district over in Donaldson um, on the east margin of Graham. We're just kind of southwest of Lebanon Pike and Briley Parkway. This is an aerial photograph of the subject property. The applicant has an existing detached accessory building located here and his request is to construct another adjacent uh, and put an addition on that building as well. So two issues before you, one is the variance and side setback that is along the southern property boundary on the driveway side in the aerial photograph that would be here. Uh, based on the drawing he submitted, uh, he is not showing a setback along that line, but the zoning ordinance requires a five foot setback so that's a variance in five. Um, forget the variance in rear setback label. I cut and pasted from the prior case. Mm. Um, this is a variance in allowable square footage. So the zoning code permits uh, residences to have detached accessory structures to a maximum of 50% of the footprint of the residence. Uh, I went to the assessor's office and took into account his uh, covered square footage and divided by two, and that is an allowable square footage of 874 square feet. The existing building added to the proposed addition uh, comes up to 1,632 square feet and thus necessitating a variance of 758 square feet. This is looking at the subject property from Graham Drive uh, and then adjoining properties. Uh, a view in the upper left down his driveway um, 
looking at the carport. I, I don't know the history of that. It doesn't appear to be in compliance, but it also appears to be quite old. So uh, may have been some previous appeal on it. There's the structure in the uh, back left corner of the property. Uh, he's proposing to put in an addition on, on the, the front on this face of the building coming toward the back of the residence and then to build a new garage in this location here. And you do have, I think, letters, uh, three or four letters in support, one in opposition to the request that were sent in to the board. Can you say again, what's the required side setback? Is it five? Five feet, yes, sir. Let me fix that while I'm here. Um, there we go. And then I'll leave the aerial photograph. But that's the case records. Our department has it. Sir, if you'll identify yourself and make your presentation to the board. Uh, my name is Kevin Glenn. I live at 241 G-R-A-E-M-E -E Drive. I never know how to pronounce that. Um, my, first of all, I'd like to ask a question, if I may. Um, the, there's a fence where that car is. That fence, I understood from the documents I found, uh, public documents, that the fence is three feet off the line? Are you saying it's five? I, I, I was not certain, sir. I, I went just exclusively uh, off your site plan and just okay. my view. You, you may actually have some setback in there. That's, yes, there is, there is three feet. According to all the documents I found, there's three sure, feet. So I'm asking a two-foot variance uh, so that I can build the garage to the edge of the asphalt, of uh, the pavement there. Um, and the, the building that is there is a woodworking shop. Uh, I do a lot of repurposing uh, from, you know, do repurposing materials. And I have three vehicles, uh, my wife's car, my car, and I have a work van which houses all of my, a lot of my work tools for work. Uh, I, I work for HGL management, which means I do a lot of construction type stuff. We're seeing an increase. Right now, Donaldson Hills is an excellent neighborhood to be in. I love the neighborhood, but we are seeing an increase in surrounding areas of uh, car break-ins, uh, vandalism, things like that. And what I would like to do is to secure my vehicles in a garage. It's not gonna be a tall garage. It's not gonna be two stories. I'm not gonna have a dog grooming business in it. Uh, I don't have any trees to take down. Um, but I just need to secure the three vehicles I have and mainly the, the van, and the van is a large vehicle, which means it requires a little more depth. Uh, I'm looking at going, there, the rear setback was already approved uh, on that building. There, was, uh, there were uh, letters of approval from all of the utilities, and so I was told that the, back, the setback in the rear is not an issue. So I would like to continue that line across that building, uh, from the back of the building, across the, the asphalt, and just build a cover for the three vehicles and to secure them. Uh, that is, in essence, what I'm looking for. Any questions? I will say, I wouldn't want your jobs. <laughs> I've been here all day and would not want your jobs. I have a new respect for this council. <laughs> Mm. We want to raise. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we don't get, get paid for these I, jobs either. I'll put in that they double your pay. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. From uh, zero to zero. <laughs> zero. Exactly. There you yeah. go. So, you know, one of the things that, okay. that okay. we, you know, we're kind of required to find is a hardship. And, and right. I, you, the hardship, I mean, I, you already have an existing building that's a shop. And so, you know, I mean, I think that the fact that you already have an existing building that has a different purpose and is not, you know, yeah. a garage is something to consider. Are, that your home uh, is appears to be pretty close to the same size as most of your neighbors. Is it, would you pretty, say it's about pretty the same? Clo pretty close. Um, actually, if you look two doors up, right there at the top of that picture, uh, that roof there, that actually right there where your cursor is, is a two-story, it is now a two-story house. 
Uh, and then he has, man, I wish he had just a little bit more up there. Uh, he has a two-story garage also behind his house. Uh, so his house is, has been added on just in the last couple of years. My neighbor behind me, uh, James there, has added on to his house several times. So his house is a bit larger also. Okay. I do also have the support of everyone around me. I think all of the letters you received, uh, Scarlett Weir lives right next door up above me. Kara Gibbs lives on the lower side. James is behind me. Trevor Garner is across the street. Two, streets, uh, two doors up is Joe Stillman. All of them supported it. And, uh, and actually, I think there's another neighbor around the corner that's not on this picture that also sent a letter, Michelle Boozen. Uh, my city councilman, Jeff Syracuse, is in support. He has actually come to my house, and I've explained to him exactly what I want to do. And his initial reaction was, I don't see a problem with that. And that was before we found out that we were that close yeah. on the side. And so you want a three foot setback on the side, is that right? It's actually two foot. Well, okay, you'll be, I guess you would have a two foot variance for right. a three foot setback on the side. Uh, it would go to where the fence is, the, right where that fence is next to the car. So you'll be three foot off the property line? Correct, which okay. my asphalt is right now. Okay. I will not be. I will not be going beyond what is already set with asphalt. And then, well, your addition. You said it was a one-story building. It's it, it's not taller than your home. Actually, I was thinking about that when you were. Uh, there was an earlier yeah. case, and the. Do you have the width, the depth of the house? Because the garage is, we're going to maintain the roof line of the shop on the backside, and it is a very small slope. You can see okay. that. So that is 16 feet wide. By going 24, you're going to have, it's going to go above that roof line, but that is not as tall as my house. Yeah, that's what I meant. It's, a, it's right. your house. So, so you I, should, don't believe, I don't believe it's going to be as tall so as the house. You shouldn't see it from the street. Correct. The, unless you're looking down the driveway. Or, and then you've got a problem to be on my driveway. <laughs> okay. Well, those are questions. I had. Any other have, questions? There's, I noticed there's a covered porch that's shown on it. Is that, I'm yes, sorry. I, sorry. I, yeah. I, 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 these masks. Yeah. But, you know. I understand. We're we're all in that same boat. Yeah. I, I, she showed a covered porch on the front of the shop area. Is it? Can you explain what that for? Is that that's being added on? That yeah. That actually you won't even see that anywhere. Uh, but there is yeah. That, and that really didn't have anything to do with the variance. But it is just an open porch. I plan to put my porch swing on there. And um, actually, I want to. Not that y'all care. I have a bunch of antique tools, and I'm going to display them on the front wall, but I want to have a roof to keep the rain off them. So that's gotcha. basically it. But, and actually, it will aesthetically, it will be in line with the front of the garage. Uh, so aesthetically, it would be across. But that is, that is to remain an open porch. That's not going to be closed in. So if that's what you're concerned with, is, is closing it in to, uh, but it's, I, I want an open porch with a tin roof. All right. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Did you have anything else to add? Um, just like I said, I've had, I've got the support of, I've talked to my neighbor, actually before I even went into all this appeal, uh, I talked to the neighbors uh, around me and said, hey, this is what I have in mind. All of them were in support and then several of them came out writing letters. One of the letters is from HJL Management, who owns 25 properties in the hot, in the neighborhood, uh, not to mention the other neighbor, the other properties they have. So, an owner of 25 properties is in support. Okay. Is there any intent to use this as a, a rental property or a short term? Oh town? no. Okay. Absolutely not. Okay. I'm sorry, but no, sir. <laughs> it's it's to house three vehicles. That's it. So if, if we were to put a condition on the the garage and the workshop that it not be rented as a short-term rental, that you would have no objection? I have no objection. Okay. Absolutely not. By the way, I got the Mennonites building it, so the building's going to look great, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Any other questions? 
All right. Any, did you have anything else to add? I do not. All right. Then we will close the public hearing. Thoughts? You know, I think hardship is one. It's a tough one on this one um, because it just, but, you know, as I said, it, um, but I think it is that this is a, an existing outbuilding with no garage and um, that, that has been a workshop, I think, for a while. So, um, so I, I'm, you know, again, with all the surrounding neighbors and the council person, I'm, I'm not feeling uh, negative on it because it just, you know, it, it, I, th I think I, I can see a path, even though I think that it's a, a lot of building on a lot, but you know, I think when you want to do that, you cover all your bases and you give us a good reason and I'm, I'm okay with that. But again, I'm I'm one of seven, so that's just my my thing. So you, you, the hardship to you is that there's a the, current shop there. Yeah, that there's an existing existing shop. I mean, it, you know, and you could say, well, you know, you if you want to park cars, that's your choice, and and I get that. But you know, I I've got I got I'm I'm a very lucky person that has three buildings on my home uh, lot, and 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 one is my art studio, and and you know. I don't know if, you know, it, it, again, it was, it all went through Metro Historic and all that when it was supposed to, but it, it, um, you know, had, had, had I been told I would have to have a choice between my garage and my studio, I'd probably not have my studio because, you know, I'm not the only one that parks cars in the garage, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, so I, I, I guess I'd, uh, that would be my case if I were to make a case for the hardship on it, that the, that the existing workshop um, shouldn't uh, prevent this from happening since all the neighbors are for it and this council member's not opposed. But again, I'm only one of seven on the board. Can you just try a motion? Uh, I'll move that the, uh, thank you. It's late, it's late. My brain is fried, I apologize. You know, it, and, and, and the applicant may be, uh, it may actually benefit from being last on a long day, mm -hmm. but uh, I'll move that the, that we approve a side setback variance of uh, three feet uh, off the property line and uh, provide a variance for the maximum allowable square footage for the uh, garage that uh, the applicant presented to uh, us in his case uh, based on the fact that the uh, existing workshop uh, created a, a hardship in terms of the, his ability to have a garage. I will second. Friendly have a amendment. motion, have a second. Friendly amendment, please. Yes, sir. That, and I think he's already agreed to it, but that we not have, because it is so much of a building, that it not be used at any time for a uh, short-term rental. Or, a dw or dwelling. A dwelling okay. or dog run. So that that'll be in, that'll 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 be and I'll add I'll add uh, two conditions. I'll add the one that that Mr. Lawless su uh, suggested that that if the if the if any portion of that building is to be used for uh, dwelling, that the applicant would have to come back to this board for permission, and that the porch uh, section added to the workshop not be enclosed without coming back to this board for permission. Uh, any other discussion? Second then, that. Also second that. okay, that was okay. That motion was, and, and the additions were uh, seconded. All in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Oh. All opposed. Mr. What did, were you? Yeah, my husband. You're for? Sure. Okay, that motion passes. <laughs> just, just for the record, just for the record. All right, the good. Run is what put yeah, exactly. All right, well, well, good luck, and this meeting is done. <laughs>